We'll get started in about 30 seconds here. I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a, I'll do that. <laughs> so I don't have a written copy of this thing, so I'm going to be doing a lot of the slide. That's fine. We can slide across stage. Let's go ahead and go to the, I'm going to introduce myself here in a second, but let's go ahead and go to the first slide. I'm going to start real quickly. I usually don't. I usually skip this part, and I get chided for for doing so uh, because I don't like necessarily talking about me. But it does matter, you know, kind of who we're coming from. That we do, you know, have a little bit of, of knowledge of what we're doing, and we're not just some uh, somebody out there that's just talking without knowing what we're talking about. Uh, Burnett Media Group. We have a, a remarking consulting firm. Been doing this uh, in some form, uh, not social media, obviously, but for more than 30 years. But we have a Burnett Media Group's been around since 2007. And uh, we have 16 key members that are part of our full-time team. Uh, social media is about 30% of what we do. About 50% of that's in commercial. About 50% of that's in, uh, in the, there you see the divisions of that. In, in political, we divide that out clearly. And we do assign specific social media managers to the political ones that align with the candidates or issues that we're talking about. We take it pretty seriously. Uh, we do two, two to three, 300 posts per day out of our, our uh, office. And I know we average, it, 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 this varies extremely widely. I mean, if something goes viral, we could literally have a million engagements plus in a, in a week. So it's, uh, that's when we ramp up to do that. But on average, we'll have 1,000 to 1,500 engagements per day. Um, anyway, so social media is changing a lot and it's changing actively. So I wanted to just tell you who we are, what we're doing. And this is one of those things where I, I revised this entire thing this morning, which is why I don't have a written one. Uh, just because it, the, it, it hit me this morning on some, the to topic I set up and was ready to talk about today was just too granular. And I think the topics are much more top level right now in the news. And I thought maybe we would just you know, touch on some top level things of social media and then go to you guys for questions to see which direction you want to take it. Because any one of these slides is essentially a presentation on its own. Um, let's go to the next one. The point of social media, let's start there. I'm going to start with a very top level, very, uh, very generic in general. Why do we do social media at all? And I'm just going to you know, touch on a few of these just because it, it helps to reflect and go back to this. I, connection, people think about social media as a, a way to connect to people. I want to meet with others like me or unlike me. That's fine. Communicate, we have something we want, we want people, other people to hear. Activate, that's more of our world a little bit. We have, uh, we have something we want others to do. Totally different goals, totally different use of social media than having something to say. Uh, influence, which is really where we get down to the, uh, the nitty gritty of, uh, of actually using it, social media as a tool and not just playing with it. Uh, influence is where you actually want to change positions or change minds or shift people in a, uh, for a candidate or an issue or in my case organizations as well in, uh, in more uh, gain influence or gain uh, more favorability for what you're trying to discuss. Let's go to the next one. Social truisms, these are all very big, again, top level bullet points that I will always want to remind people, and this is where we have a discussion here just a second ago about it. Social is forever. Um, I'm constantly dealing with issues despite how hard, it, you know, how hard we try. I'm going through, a, uh, you know, going through a candidate issue right now where we're scrubbing the last 10 years as he's getting ready to run a year from now. Um, so it's, it's something, again, we're talking about, you know, the campaign started 10 years ago. This is why I say that. Um, we've all seen the news stories and they're not as uncommon as you think anymore. It's almost standard now when we're running candidate races where you'll have now, I mean, we have history of Facebook going back to what, 2008, nine? Uh, we have, uh, and if you said something off the cuff, not necessarily even on your wall, but on somebody else's wall, a comment that you don't even remember from 15 years ago, or 12 years ago now, uh, it, it, it can be screenshotted and taken completely out of context and used to sink you. And trust me, they will. So be careful about what you do going forward. And if you're a serious candidate, do take the time. One of the biggest things to do is scrub your social media. Even if you, you have to look at it a different, a different way. From a candidate's perspective, it's very different than an activist's perspective. And I'll get to that in a minute. But as a candidate, you can't say the things you would as an activist. So you pretty much have to choose your path in a social world. If you look at my, my Facebook, you'll see that it's literally like sunsets and puppy dogs, even though a big part of my life is social media. 
there is no political on my Facebook because I don't have a political life. I do on some Twitter accounts that nobody knows about, but that's a different issue. The, uh, but as far as, uh, that's just to get the steam out of my head. The, uh, but for the most part, my, I'm not allowed to have a social media life in the political world because I speak on behalf of other people, and I don't want my, my, my life to anchor somebody else's life. So if it gets connected to me, which it does, because I'll get calls from the media during a candidate race, and uh, they'll be looking at what I said on my Facebook. And if it's puppy dogs and sunsets, what are they going to say? So I don't want me to get tangled up with them. That's my route. That's my world. Different than yours, technically, in a lot of ways. Everybody has different routes. That's where I want to go. Social media is not just one thing. But remember, it lives forever. So first thing when you're doing a candidacy, do go through your entire history or have someone else do it from a perspective, an outside perspective. Um, we know we kind of have a gut instinct and just use kind of have some self-awareness on that on what, if you're a candidate, what would matter now. Something you said 10 years ago might have been very appropriate 10 years ago. As of last week, it's not. You know, it's, uh, it's the way life changes. So we just have to be aware of those things as a candidate. Uh, it's a reality of life. The only thing in, uh, that we're talking about here on social is change. Um, the, I changed this presentation this morning. Uh, the news is, is what drives this, and social media is something that the rules that we had two weeks ago don't, well, they still exist, they've just adapted a lot. So we're constantly evolving how we use it and how we, I don't say game it, it's a bad way to put it, but to make sure that we gain the most of what our goals are out of it. Um, and if I, you know, the presentation I gave here last year, I, I, would, I would adapt almost every slide. It was very appropriate last year and uh, some of the core elements are appropriate, but the rest is not. But in general, they do change a lot. We have to be on top of it. The other thing you have to think about is uh, to be successful in social media, which means whatever those things we talked about in the previous thing, do you want to communicate? Do you want to influence? Do you want to activate? What, are, what is it you want to do? If you want to be successful in those areas, you have to have a strategy of some kind. You can't just go on there at two in the morning and, and do, a, do a tweet that we see people do. Uh, you have to have some kind of purpose. Uh, you know, you have, to, you have to know what you're doing before you do it. You have to have some kind of intent. I always call this the reverse mullet, uh, you know, the whole business in the front and party in the back. Uh, social media is more like party in the front, business in the back. You have to do a lot of thought and a lot of, lot of thinking. It's worth the effort to make it look casual. And casual actually gets you further in social media than almost anything. At times, the more formal and the more clean and the more professional your image looks and, the, and you appear, sometimes, there's lots of exceptions, sometimes that actually is a turnoff. Uh, the more real you look, the more spontaneous you look, the more virality, the more reach you'll get, the more people will trust you and let their guard down. And quite honestly, those take more thought than the professional ones. So it's, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of games to it. Uh, so it's, it's not, uh, sometimes the, uh, a lot of these, a lot of companies, a lot of candidates will try to do the most polished, clean, uh, Mitt Romney-ish types of posts. And you end up, you end up uh, making people think that you're a politician, which is not the opposite of what you want them to think. So social is not real. We've got to remind ourselves. It used to be kind of, maybe, where we would post things and say, here's my life. Here's what it's about. This is social media. This is me. We have to understand that it's evolved dramatically, and it's evolving dramatically today. Social media is a personality. Social media looks nothing like me. It looks nothing like you. We all joke about it, I guess, to some extent, or we've heard jokes about it, that social media is, you know, my life is really better on social media, or you have a really great life on social media. No one lives a life they live on social media. Okay, so it, acknowledging that, we have to realize that there is a little bit of a game to it. We all like to say that we want to be honest and clean and transparent, and that's great, and we do. It's just that we want the right kind of transparency and the right kind of honesty. And, you know, we don't want people to see our dirty underwear on social media, in a sense, you know, metaphorically. Uh, it's something where we want to make sure that we have thought going behind things and realize that it's not real life. And acknowledging that, we have to plan our social media around it not being real life. Okay, it doesn't look like us. It's only a tool. Those are kind of repeating what we're saying. In social media, another thing people tend to forget is, and we're reminded of these last couple weeks, is that you are not the customer of social media. Facebook does not work for you. Twitter does not work for you. You are the product. Anything you get for free, and they sell people to talk to you, they, I buy a lot of advertising with Facebook. 
and, regrettably, but we do. And <laughs> you understand real quickly, and I, you know, it's creepy how detailed of, of, of information I can get on people. I mean, on real, how detailed I can get on people and what they track on you. So acknowledging that again, you understand that you're not the customer of Facebook. I am, because I'm buying information and giving them money to find out about you. You are the product I'm buying. Okay, so social media is uh, evolved into something where it's not fun, kitty cats. You are the product that say, Facebook uses to sell to other people. That's their entire point. They don't care about you or anything else than that. So again, these are the things you have to acknowledge when you're using it to get to the goals we want to get to. If we try to delude ourselves other than this, then we're probably going to be unsuccessful at social media. Um, let's see. Yeah, acknowledge that you're the brand. Last thing, last part, just kind of sum it all up there. I know it's depressing, but never take it personal. It is a little bit of a game. It is uh, just like anything else. Uh, it is a little bit of, and you know, my entire life I get, I guess, a little bit delusioned with it, but it is an entire game. It is how do we package people up the best way? How do we just deliver the message in the best way to get the most votes possible to win an election? Sounds cold. It's the reality of life we live in. Let's go to the next slide. Social is not free. The new rules. We found that one out. So there is no such thing as free speech on social media. Again, you are not the customer. So understanding that, you have to play within the rules you're given, and you have to make them work the best for you. It's harder to break through than it's ever been. A few years ago, uh, even, well, gosh, it's only been a year ago even, not even two years, where if you posted something, you tweeted something out on Twitter, every one of your followers saw it. Uh, you're lucky to get five, five to ten percent of your followers see a tweet now. It's uh, the banning of how the algorithms go to show your your message to somebody else is what you have to break through. So you have to play the game. Um, it's just something to acknowledge that you understand how it's used and how social media is used. Less news, more drama. <laughs> That's kind of where we're going. It is less about what's the uh, what's the news of the day, and it's more about what's the brand and message you're going to do. Social media is heart driven, not head driven. And we see that by the clickbait that we see in news media. It's why news media headlines are the way they are. Uh, it's not, the, if they, they, they want to tell you just a fact, if they decide to be OPB, they are going to be the most boring people in the world and nobody will click and they will not get to be able to monetize it and make money off of their headline. So news is about drama. If it bleeds, it leads was the old adage going back forever in news. And that's no less true, it's way more true today. Uh, a headline is about what's the most salacious thing you can say in order to get a click. Um, it's drama. So they're telling a story, they're weaving a narrative, and we have to play that game. So one of the big things on the rule is uh, another thing we want to keep, keep in mind is a content on social media has never been more important. Sharing things is great, making comments is great, creating your own content and leading a, a conversation, and I don't want to go too deep into that, but it's something to keep in mind, creating your own content and getting a lot of it out there and being original and pushing a message is how you break through in social media. And uh, that's just one of the, probably the most effective, that's going to be more important now than ever. Uh, again, don't want to go too deep into that. We can have a whole conversation on content at another time. Um, voice and numbers. Trolling used to, be, uh, used to be like the thing that you call somebody when they're you know, an evil, horrible person that's disrupting you on social media. Trolling is, like, uh, is a virtue at this point. And you know, people have their entire careers on social media. That's all they do now. They go on and harass people and push people and try to trigger them into saying stuff. That's, it makes it into a little bit of a dumpster fire at times. But that's the, uh, it's become a virtue in social media. So be aware of that, that whole don't take it personal thing. Um, Every single voice matters. It does. Despite all of this, I want to recircle back that you on social media can make a difference. You can break through. In fact, you have to break through, especially in the COVID universe that we're in this last year. And going forward, that's not going to change a lot for the near future. And it's becoming more important. We saw this in campaigns over the last year that the less you can get out and shake hands and kiss babies, the more you have to talk online the more that people's impressions of you are formed on an online universe through social media, website, articles, content you create. That's the only thing people can know about you if you can't talk to them directly. So despite everything I've said before, it's actually more important than ever to be involved in social media. So every, it does matter and your voice does matter. You can't make a difference. Influence is real, it's beneficial, it's achievable. It just takes a lot more work. Okay, real quickly, platforms. 
Facebook may not know it yet. They might. But they have lost all ownership of social media. In the end, they might think they own you, but their influence is rapidly fading, and it's uh, in many ways they're losing control of who they are. Um, you know, the, the whole rumor of Facebook's going to die and be overtaken for, has been around for 10 years, but it really has jumped the shark in the last month. They're not going away anytime soon. They have a zillion, zillion followers. What is it, 1.5 billion or whatever. Uh, so people are going to keep using them. That's not the problem. But they, by, by taking the steps they have, they have made it clear that people are now more aware of what's going on. The people that weren't awake uh, from uh, an understanding that this was a nice little kitty cat chat board are not as naive anymore. That's where I'm going. So the influence of people investigating alternatives and how they use social media is absolutely taking impact. If, you, if you're on Facebook chat boards and talking to people that are actually pro, big time pro Facebook and trying to figure out how to solve it, you'll see the panic. Uh, they are panicking in a lot of ways. Uh, they're discussing it actively on how to gain back the credibility that they are actively destroying at the same time. Who knows, right? So uh, the platforms uh, that we say back on there, it's not just, uh, you can see the main ones. Fa you know, social media is not just Facebook, um, obviously. In our world, probably most of us, it is, um, and that's fine. And if that's your universe, that's wonderful. But do try to reach outside of that because every little bit helps, especially we're gonna be focusing on candidates more here than anything else, of course. So as candidates, you want to make sure that you have at least Facebook, for the short term at least, it might change next year, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, you have to have those four, and a Google My Business if possible, if you have a headquarters or location. You have to have those. Do watch, and it does make sense, at some point, Parler, right? But MeWe, Parler, Telegram, Rumble, Symbol, Signal are all things you need to be looking at. Um, it doesn't hurt to have a profile and reserve something on there. I know Gab as well, yes. <laughs> and there, there are ones that, that, there are several others as well, but Gab's a good one as well. Uh, and see which one develops. Doesn't hurt to have a profile set up for your person. And if you know that you're going to be running for office at some point, just reserve the profiles in every platform and make it generic. It doesn't have to be J, you know, uh, John Smith for uh, Washington County Commissioner. It can be John Smith for Oregon. Okay, just start your committee name that's generic. Uh, you know, and, and you can use, her, you can transfer that and build the audience there and eventually activate it for whatever you decide to do, because you're in Oregon. Cool. So, uh, so those are the platforms. It doesn't hurt just to start them all. You can always update the name and change it when you have an official committee name and so on, but get them reserved. Go to the next slide. Do, 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 do. Choose your role, be self-aware. This is where I'm gonna go with the roles. Next one. This is where I say you really have to choose your path, and I can't emphasize this enough. Who you are on social media is more important. You can't be yourself. It's the way it is. You got, if you're going to be a candidate, you certainly can't be yourself. Uh, you, you have to be, unless you're, the, you're actually born as a candidate. There's a few of those yeah, that are people that are born. In, but, but candidacy requires uh, something I don't have, for sure. Um, it, it requires reservation. It requires self-control. It requires more self-awareness than I probably have. Um, it has to, you have to have, understand that when you're speaking, you're, under, you're speaking on behalf of your brand, not necessarily yourself. And what you want to say is not as important as what you need to say. And I think you can probably understand where I'm going there. Um, it doesn't mean ever lie or ever say that this truth or ever say anything, but as a candidate, if you're successful, you understand there's ways of saying things and ways of responding to things and ways of phrasing things that you probably wouldn't do if you're sitting across having a beer with your friend. That's all I'm getting at. The first role I want to look at is, uh, I just want to go through the, the other roles first to show you the difference, not to highlight, because here we're talking about more candidacies, but as an activist influencer, which is kind of a lot of us, honestly, if you're not running for office, if you're a lot of us start out as activists, I did. And uh, you know, in the past, I've had to go through and get rid of a lot of my past stuff uh, in, when I've evolved my role. But as an activist influencer, you're the, you, know, you can be a lot more aggressive. You can say things you wouldn't necessarily say as a candidate. You can say the things that will come back to haunt you if you're a candidate. So be aware that if you're going, if you do plan to run for office, you don't go too far down the activist role. Uh, you can say things here that you would, uh, that you can, that you can push the agenda. You can be a little more aggressive. You can be a little more pointed and quite honestly stand out. Uh, and that's, you know, that has its own place on social media, but the two don't mix. Yep. 
Understand the important, this one thing just to be aware of, do understand the important impact on your private and business life. Um, it just needs to be aware, most of you probably will never have this happen, but it is actively done. There's doxing out there, there is, I've had pictures of my house posted and you know, you know message to me on Facebook. I've had uh, my wife's phone call, uh, phone call from, and get a text messages from people that are vaguely threatening. It happens. And during campaigns, if you're going to get on, especially if you're an activist, you're going to get in areas where people are going to try to intimidate you, and social media is a great way to do that. I've had my commercial businesses called, and do you realize who he supports? Messages. Um, and it happens. You just have to deal with that and understand that's part of life if you want to advance your political goals. And is it worth it? So that's what you have to ask. As a candidate, you're not gonna run into that as much, but you do, as a lot of you candidates can attest, give up part of your personal life by choosing that direction. That's just part of the cost. Um, let's see. Pick your topics, if you're gonna be an activist, pick, you know, I'm just gonna go through these real fast here, but pick your topics if you're an expert. Pick your things that you're going to be an expert at. So you're not just all over the place. You're not an expert on everything and don't pretend to be and don't wanna be. You're more effective if you choose the topics that you are really going to have uh, influence on. Pick them, whether it's transportation or taxes or environment or whatever the issue is, pick those areas and find out as much as you can about those things so when you're talking, you have a better way to win your argument and influence others, and that's a whole other discussion, but you have a better way to do it so you're not just the guy sounding off and getting ignored. So again, if you have a goal, if your goal isn't just to talk, and your goal is actually to influence, then have, a, have some knowledge behind it. That's all I'm saying. Um, and, and when you're an expert on those topics, make sure you surround yourself with other people like that, that both agree and disagree with you, that you can actually build your argument. The best way to build my argument, I actually have profiles that I run that are groups that I completely disagree with and my profile is somebody I completely disagree with just so I can be involved in those communications and make the argument the opposite way. I know I'm neurotic about it and most people won't do that, but it is a healthy way to try to make the argument from the other side and see if it holds up, adjusts your opinions or if it actually supports and makes your opinions stronger on the side that you're originally on. It's a healthy way to go. Um, educate and activate. Okay, we've gone through the, uh, let's go to the next slide here, because that's really, uh, I want to talk more about this one, candidate, because we're short on time on everything, so I want to go towards that. Candidate is a special category in social media, and I repeat repeating that, but it is critical. Perception is reality. What people think of you is real. People vote for you because they feel something, not because they know something. And we all, uh, the same exact candidate as we all know and we see in the news every, every single day, two different candidates could do the, from different parties could do the exact same thing. One is crucified for it, the other one is held up on their shoulders. It happens and no denying this, it's just reality of life and where it is. You have to be aware of what is going on and what it's going to be seen as from your perspective and decide and make your strategy from that perspective. So there is a lot of thought that goes into understanding perception and creating your brand and understanding and communicating this because as a candidate your goal is to win an election. Your goal is to be able to be in a position where you can actually make decisions that further your political goals. It's cold and callous but that's the world we live in. So that's a, that's a little bit fun. I actually love it. Um, everything you can't say can and will be held against you. It repeats what we were talking about before. If you put something online it lives forever. Yes you can scrub it. Good luck with that. Uh, we've had some races where, you know, we recently, where we have scrubbed things and they had screenshots from the opposition research from more than two years ago that came out in the news. And even after we had deleted them, they're still published as news articles that were used against us. So be careful, that's all I'm saying. So those things will come back and haunt you even out of context. So just be cautious if you're a candidate. Um, I already that. Yeah, it's very, very different to influence votes over opinions. It, it really is, uh, if you're an influencer, an activist, it's a very different game than if you're trying to get people to vote for you and support your candidacy. That's all I want to do. You activate, you don't educate. Uh, and that's one of the rules we talk about in, as a candidate, you're less, you're, your role, it's a little bit of a nuance, but your role is a little more about activating something people already understand and believe in their gut in their soul, they already have a belief of some kind and you're just reaffirming that. You're going, you know that thing you feel? I agree with you and I wanna support that and I want to be the voice for that thing in your gut that you feel. 
And it, that's the kind of message you're trying to go after. Your message isn't to say, hey, you know that thing you feel? You should feel something different. That's not your role. Uh, it, as a candidate, you're looking for getting votes. You're not looking at changing minds. That's the activist's role. Even though, again, it's nuanced, we do a little of both in real life no matter what. Just telling you that's how it kind of divides out. Let's go to the next one. Just want to go over the last couple categories. I like to you tell people uh, just to show again, just to differentiate what the role of a candidate versus an activist. A team leader is going. Uh, role is kind of my world where I have the most boring social media life in the world, as far as anybody knows. Um, and it's it's because of the things I talked about. My personal is political. Everything I do can and will be held against my clients. So I got to be careful about what I post and what I say, uh, because I'm that jerk that said something five years ago, it can sink a candidacy, and that's just not fair. I'm not a good consultant or a uh, social media manager for candidates specifically in politics if I am a weight on them when I'm supposed to be the one supporting them. So this role is a little bit more rare. Uh, it's a little bit more, uh, a lot more thought put into it, but it's certainly something that you have to choose. Uh, just want to let you know that there's different roles there are. Okay. We'll run through this real fast so we get to the fun part. Okay, the last one. And then, of course, the personal. If you want to post, uh, you know, if you want to post kitty cats and sunsets for your own personal fun, that's great, but that's not politics. That's cool, and that's the original 2009 Facebook. And I wish that's all it was still in some regards, and I long for those good old days, but there's not very many personal profiles on social media anymore. Next. I'm going to go through these again. I'm sorry, I'm just throwing all this at you real fast. But again, these are all top-level topics. Any one of these we could go deep into a little bit more. But just want to, I'm not going to go through each bullet point. But when you're building influence on a personal level, and this is where you're looking at, doesn't matter what role you are, you want to make sure that it's part of your day. You actually set time aside to go on social media. It can't be an afterthought where you're, you know, you're sitting around 11 o'clock at night and go, oh, I should look at my Facebook. It has to be a thought of the day. It is more critical than ever. Five years ago, I wouldn't have given you this, even been as strongly advising as I am now on this. It has to be a well thought out strategy. It's easy to forget about it, to let it go, to have it be in the back burner. But if you want to win a, a race of any kind, and if you want to have any kind of influence as a candidate, you better make social media a part of your daily activity. It doesn't have to consume your entire existence. It just has to be part of your day. Uh, set your comfort level. That's where I'm going. Don't worry about it consuming your life. And again, it's going to change based on the level of this is going to change on based on what kind of uh, uh, office you're going for. If you're going for uh, the local vector control, like Rich likes to talk about, it's not going to be a huge part of your life. If you're going for state rep seat, you better have a plan. And you better have people helping you out. Okay, and and everything in between. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into the details of this. We can go through any one of those. And I and just as a side note, this this. Uh, Soapbox campaigns that Rich and I have been working on for literally a couple years now, but we're coming to the end. Hopefully, in the next six to eight weeks or so, we'll be launching the first uh, phase of it. Uh, part of that is going to be the um, uh, discussing. The week, we're going to have weekly phone calls and, and resources online to where we can actually go into any one of these levels, and you can become a little mini expert in social media if you'd like to. <coughs> part, of the t part of what I do with candidates now, if they're willing to put in the time, and the good ones do, uh, the ones that are serious about winning. Uh, but if you want to put on time, it's the best social media campaigns are the ones that you work with somebody and you do what you do best. So you choose where, you know, you're honest with each other and you say, here's where you're good at social media, here's where I'm good, here's how we work together. And I work with a software with our clients and they put in their posts and I edit them and I post the right schedule to make sure I get the most eyeballs and all the technical stuff. And then I add the parts where the candidate is not as comfortable. So I'm in there adding the branding posts and the news of the day, and and uh, the the candidate might be posting the pretty sunset or something you know, out working in the working in the field with their their family or their their kids uh, out in the community shaking hands if that was legal, uh, that kind of stuff. More the personal fun things, and uh, and then every once in a while the thought of the day, what they're thinking about, what's on their mind, and we can position these things together and work as a team. That's, the, that's, you know, so it doesn't consume the candidate's entire life at the same time as it gets the most out of social media. So it's every candidate's going to be a little bit different, and we customize it for that purpose. So it really is reflective of their voice and the best assets from both sides. Local races, you're going to be doing most of that yourself, and that's fine. That's why we're going to have some of those online courses to help you out in those areas where you can get more comfortable. 
Um, and just as just to kind of circle back on that is, is say why we do it is is everything we do is based on numbers everything we do is based on impact so I, I, I have that old old adage from the old ad days where if it's not if it's not it's not creative if it doesn't sell so it's the same idea in social media it's it's good if it works if it doesn't work it's not so it's not a personal opinion. It's the mix of everything we're doing. Is it building influence? Is it getting more eyeballs? Are you getting, you're moving your brand forward? Then do more of that. If it's not, then do less of that. It's an adjustment and you do adapt over time. And a lot of this, the nice thing about social media is it does tell you in real time what's working and what's not. And if you watch it close enough and you're able to watch where the analytics are going, you can adjust real easily. The downside of that is it's a lot of work. Uh, but you can know it very quickly. Real quick. Yeah. There, so the people in Zoom can hear the question. <laughs> Stacy from KSLM, explain the difference about having your personal page mm -hmm. and a campaign page, mm -hmm. and why it's so important that your people that are following you share that then on their page sure. to build that audience. Absolutely, it's one of the areas we want to get for you. Definitely one of the areas to expand your brand is, uh, I mean, everybody, if you're doing candidate, you want to have your personal page, but you also want to have your your business page. They're talking about Facebook specifically here. Um, so yeah, you want to have a, uh, have a business page. Usually you want to do that through a business manager. It's a little more technical, but once you build a page, it's, it's absolutely something you want to promote. And that's why I was telling you earlier on, if you know you're going to be running for office, it's a good idea to start building that now. Um, even if you're building it around an issue and it's not even official candidacy, I've had clients that take do it a year in advance where they're like, uh, again, John Smith for Oregon. And you're talking about just the issues that concern you in the community and you get your friends to start liking it and build that audience. The earlier the better. If you're thinking about, if you're starting social media three months before an election date, it's a lot harder road. Uh, and it's, a, it's gonna require a lot more money to get what you could get organically a year ahead of time. So everything you do is, is that one of those ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you set up your business page and you do the, put the work in early and regularly, it is it pays off in droves. You want to have that army ready to activate and share. The details of how you do that is a whole other conversation, but encouraging people to like your page, encouraging people to follow you on, on Twitter, the daily routine of following certain kinds of influencers and how you get them to share you and mention you, all that's part of the game. More details for sure. Rich will get you in a second here. Um, let's do this gentleman. He's been waiting for a while. Then we'll come back to you okay. and then over here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Gregory. And <clears throat> I'm curious about uh, how you handle this idea that it's not real. I, I, I think I disagree pretty intensely with <laughs> what Antifa does with it. <laughs> and so elected officials now will commonly say, ah, you can't believe how many threats I get. And <laughs> a part of it is you almost think, are they telling the truth because there aren't police reports? So when you're consulting, mm -hmm. at what point do you take something where somebody is calling for violence against your client? You say, oh, we have to file a report mm -hmm. because this is, we need to you know, memorialize this or something. Mm -hmm. I think I understand your question. And, yeah. and I want to be real careful what I mean by it's not real. Do I think violence and threats of violence are real? Oh, yeah. Uh, we get them all. I mean, we had a candidate that we just had to hire security a few months ago because of a social media post. You know, we had armed security at her house. So, yeah, it's real. Uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> we have, I have death threats, you know, coming through social media almost on a daily basis on one of our platforms. And I certainly report those. Uh, and I certainly ban them. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, even though there's some laws around public pages banning if you're in you know, elected office, there's ways around that if there are threats of violence and everything, but again, a little more nuance, but absolutely that's, what I mean by not real is, it, you're not the same person on social media as you are as a, having a beer with your friend at a bar. That's where I'm going. It's not the same thing as you're hanging out fishing with your buddy and talking about things, is not the same things you would say on social media. Um, you have to have some thought put into that. And do I think that uh, a lot of the trolls are, full of crud yeah um and a lot of them are uh, violent yeah and is the violence real yeah <laughs> so and it's getting worse so uh, absolutely that's something you have to be cognizant of mm, certainly and you could and, th and there's no social media that allows threats of violence uh, technically uh, tech, i mean sure, sure they do 
But the terms, their terms and conditions, if you report them, they're supposed to be blocked or banned or at least pushed out of your. <laughs> I understand that it gets away with it. I mean, tr deal with it every day. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've reported Antifa. They don't take their stuff down. Yeah, of but, course not. But uh, uh, back to your social media Where's page it coming from? thing. Uh, right here. Oh, there you Stacey. are. Stacey, yeah. So back to the, you were talking about um, how you can change the social media page name later if you desire, right? But you can't. I learned that mm -hmm. the other day. Mm -hmm. If you have more than 100 likes, according mm -hmm. to Facebook, you can't change the name of that Facebook page. So it's good to really think about Usually you can, and it's, uh, they change the terms on that. That's another one thing that they change it all the time. Um, okay. Yeah, they have a create username and usually have one time where you can change it. Um, well, that's, no, that's why I think I might be talking about something different. Are okay. you talking a page or, a, or, or are you talking about are you talking a about page, a public not your page, not your personal? Public. So you're not setting up a group for your candidacy. You're setting up a public page. That's. I went to change mine the other day, mm. and they told me that I could change it, but if I had more than 100 likes, I wouldn't mm. be able to. Yeah, again, they change terms all the time. Okay. That could be true okay. as of yesterday. Yeah. But yes, technically, you could. There, as of as of a few months ago, it's which is the last time but I did it's this, it's, to do usually it's one time you can change a page name. Okay. Okay. But that's one of the reasons why I also do a generic name, you know, John Smith for Oregon. Yeah, and I, I, I almost always, if someone's going to have a political life, the office they run for initially is not the office they end up in, and they'll change several times in their career or maybe go into become an activist, for instance. So if they choose something that's innocuous, the, the name of your page is not going to define who you are necessarily. So I, if it was me, I would pick something. I have candidates that go back you know, seven, eight years on Facebook that have the same page they have, and they've been through two or three different offices. So it's the same name. Yeah. I just wanted to respond to this gentleman's comment um, here about security, and I, it's a sad day that we are having this discussion about security. Let's start with that, but I can tell you, I have an ongoing police report with my local police office, and every thread I snapshot it and I send it, they don't do anything. No, I'm not going to say they're going <laughs> to do anything, but I keep a record of it, and I send, and I just call, they know me by name, I call my, my guys, and I, you know, I give an update yeah. every time, and I too had to hire security, so it's very real, but a real, yeah. and I've heard some other current current candidates that are struggling with it, but it's, um, I'm, it's, it's a sad state that we're in. Yeah. There's a candidate here in this room that had to hire security recently. So yeah, it's it's not uh, it's not uh, very un uncommon. It, it, the, the process I go through, just to give you a, on that rule, if you're an elected candidate, there's the Trump rule that you know went through that the the court ruling on public records. So if you have a public page and you're a public official, legally you can't de just randomly delete or block people because it's technically a public record. You know, Trump was sued because he blocked some people. That's what, that's what went to court, and they, they overturned it and said that's illegal because it's a public record. So there are some rules on that in social media where you can't technically do that. But if there's, and they will sue you through bully and so on, and Secretary of State, and I've had those lawsuits delivered to me, it, it happens, because there's times where I have to block people. But if I'm going to block somebody that's actually on an official page, I'll take a screenshot of it, and it'll be for good cause, like a threat of violence. And then I'll ban them, and then if they do send out, because I'll, I'll, I'll still get a lawsuit of some kind or get a complaint with bully, and I'll just send them the, the screenshot saying this person threatened violence, and it'll get dropped. Uh, it just doesn't mean Facebook will take them off or Twitter will take them off, but at least they'll be out of your life. Yeah, still watch your back. <laughs> so. Okay. So just real quick, um, one, I just left Twitter. Because hmm? I got tired of the trolls, the shills, the bots, and all the hateful it's people. getting more that way. So it's like, goodbye, Twitter. I'm out of here. But um, I've been known to block people, and somebody brought that, that rule up. But I went, until I'm elected, I can block to my heart's content. Correct. And I will allow people to comment all they want. But once they start going down the road of you're nothing but an... Yeah. We know. Um, Fill in the blank. Then, then it's like... I'm done with you. Goodbye. Yeah, as a personal page, you can do whatever you want. But, but that's on my campaign page because I'm going, I'm not elected yet. I was yeah. elected as the nominee, but I didn't, I'm not sworn into yeah. office yet. So yeah. that's still legit. A little correct? more tactical. I mean, we just came around to this recently on a candidate where we had to do that. And we actually had the bully complaint a month ago. And uh, we had to, but I knew this was coming from the elected official because it always does. So tactically, what we did is we just changed the campaign page to a personal page in the description, launched an official election page, and in the description this is the official page, and then I pretty much ignore that official page except for actual official stuff. And so I still have all my personal opinions on here all I want, and I can block them because I can point over there and say that's the official page if you want to have any conversation with me officially. 
And this is my personal one, do whatever I want. So, so far that's held up. So I have a question you may not be able to answer, but I tried to change my Facebook stuff. Hmm. Bottom line is, as long as you're using your same desktop computer and they recognize your IP address, <laughs> you can't shake these people. They'll tie you to this one. Hmm. Um, it's like they, because they said, oh, using this computer with this IP address, I see that this is your email. Yeah. Is this not your email anymore? Yeah. It's like, well, you can, Jesus. I mean, I have, I have literally hundreds of profiles, so it's, it's doable. It just do you have how you to do have it. a VPN or something? Not necessarily, but most of ours are most of ours are business pages, though. So it's not there's no limits in that of any kind. So I can have I can have thousands of business pages. And I'll if you talk about Facebook, yeah, Twitter's a little more different, a little different than that. Everyone back here, Greg. Yeah. Take me a second to get back there. A lot of times I like to retweet my favorite candidates so it looks like to anyone looking at the candidate's profile that people are interested in what the candidate has to say and if you have a lot of followers then some of those followers might retweet your candidate and um, so often they're just pictures of them campaigning you know they were in a parade and they're shaking a hand or they're standing with a baby, or they're standing with guys in hard hats. And it's, it's so bland, it's hard to drum up interest for this candidate. But there are two people I've noticed on Twitter that do an excellent job of conveying their passion for what they want to accomplish in politics. And one of them is a state rep named Bill Post. I know Bill. And, yeah. he, and he just does an excellent job. And another one is Clackamas County's own county commissioner, Tootie Smith. Huh. And so I would just urge candidates to look at these two Twitter accounts and help convey the heart of why they want to get into office, who they want to help, what their issues are by the posts that they make, or hire someone else that can do it for them. Well, I'm gonna wrap up here in a second here, but that gives me a perfect segue to close out, and that's uh, since we handle Tootie Smith's campaign, and she's the best, best probably candidate we've ever worked with, and uh, she's fantastic, and she's gonna be speaking next anyway. I think that's a perfect segue into that. Uh, Tootie is a perfect example of somebody that we talked about at a conference a year ago, and well, more than a year ago now, coming up on two. Uh, that where we sat down and had a strategy a year before the election. She did, went through all the training with us. She is probably the most uh, self-aware person I know as far as candidate. And she's incredible at working with back and forth and pr providing her personal life things, like you're saying, pictures of family and so on. And that's a very well thought out, very, very, very hard work strategy to get to that point. Uh, so to make it look casual is difficult. Um, but she makes it easy in a lot of ways. So that's a perfect example of Tootie is, is, is somebody. And she's a, you know, with, she'll be talking to you about that in a bit. But uh, again, perfect segue because the posting something like, I'm going to have my friends and family to Thanksgiving dinner and having to hire armed security at your house because of it is where social media is. And managing those communications on our end where we're speaking on behalf of Tootie because it's impossible for her to handle the thousands and thousands of comments coming in as they're coming in and still live a normal life and handle her politics at the same time, so you have to have a team around you. But having the candidate to work with that is able to do that in a way that's uh, cohesive and seamless is, is critical. So it's a good way to do it. I'm gonna wrap it up there. I could go on for hours, but we, uh, I wouldn't get into details and let you know that we will be doing those uh, again more, I'm hoping to in the coming months, doing more training online to where we can get a little more granular on the candidates and I, I, I would love to, make, to help any way I can. That's where my passion came from originally. Starting the agency was to help small candidacies in the, in the late, late 80s. And trying to, make, uh, trying to figure out how to get, offer my services to get local candidates to win and to get into office when they couldn't technically afford uh, agency services and those kind of things. So this is kind of a culmination of that 30 years essentially coming back, how do we do this in modern way to, uh, to deliver that message and help local candidates. And hopefully that comes to fruition soon, even though WLN's doing it actively forever, we wanna take it to the next step. So appreciate your time. I'm actually out of Northern Idaho now. I've been in, I've been, I've just moved there 
uh, August, but I do have offices here in Tigard. Um, I was in West Lynn for the last 15 years in Oregon, born in Portland. So I finally made the move to Northern Idaho this last year. Yeah, I know. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Very proud to work with Greg. He's been a good friend for a long time and uh, appreciate all he does for Western Liberty Network. A couple quick announcements. Um, Senator Linthicum has a box of books out there on the back table there and he's giving them away. There are also some video discs and all of them have to do with uh, things that are consistent with what our founders wanted in constitutional government. So he generously is making those available. Also, I wanted to remind everyone to complete the evaluation sheets and when you leave today, please leave the evaluation sheets on the registration table. Also, I've been in touch with Steve Moore and he is slated to be uh, on the Zoom on time. It's going to be real interesting to see what he has to say with the Biden environment. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next guest who has become increasingly involved in the Western Liberty Network. Uh, she won the position of chair of Clackamas County uh, Board of Commissioners, and I would like very much to introduce Tootie Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget, those of you watching on Zoom, you can participate in this as well. Richard said he wanted to play a video for you all, but uh, in the previous speaker, Greg Burnett mentioned there was this candidate that had to hire a bunch of security guards for the Thanksgiving dinner. That would have been me, because those threats of, vi threats of violence and et cetera were real. I now have my personal FBI agent and SWAT team. Yeah, boy, is that fun. And uh, thank goodness my husband is a big Second Amendment rights guy. We live on a farm, and he's a hunter. Just saying. Right? We're going to watch this. In Oregon, a woman called Tootie Smith, who will start her term as chairwoman of the Clackamas Board of County Commissioners in January, made that very clear on Facebook. Here's what she wrote. Quote, my family will celebrate Thanksgiving dinner with as many family and friends as I can find. This is an elected official, and she joins us now, Tootie Smith, on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. It, it's, it's funny that that statement would qualify as bravery, but it certainly does. And so congratulations. Why did you write that? Because it's exactly what I felt. It's very heartfelt. She issued that edict on Friday. I posted it Saturday morning thinking about it. This is a travesty that's happening in our state. How dare Governor Brown think she's going to come out, send the police into people's homes, and arrest them and fine them for having a Thanksgiving meal with her family, while at the same time, she allows rioters and anarchists to destroy downtown city of Portland. That's hypocrisy. It's just interesting. Even in a lockdown. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Tucker. Well, but it's just people like Governor Brown would be the first ones to say, Politicians keep their hands off my body, and here she is encouraging the police to come into your home on one of the most sacred days of the year and determine who's eating there. Does she see the irony there or no, do you think? Oh, no, I don't think so at all. I think she's in total control and domination over our population. She's issued right. this edict statewide to all 36 counties, regardless of the count, regardless of the infection rate, regardless of the testing. Not even Governor Newsom from California has done that. He's allowed each county an autonomy to make their own decisions. But our governor hasn't because she obviously does not trust the elected officials in each of our counties in Oregon. We've been in a lockdown for eight months now, Tucker. People understand what to do to be healthy. We have been browbeat over the head with wearing masks in public, which I do, by the way, with social distancing, to stay home if you're sick, be clean. I think our people have the intelligence, the education, and the independence to make their own decisions. We are adults. We do not need to be treated as second-rate slaves in our own homes. 
good for you. Our viewers, if they don't know Oregon, may be confused because the Oregon we see is Portland. Oregon's a lot like Maine. It's a great state with reasonable people dominated by angry children in a city called Portland. But, but there are great people in Oregon. How's the public response been to your statement? Well, it has gone totally viral. The public response, I'm getting a lot of uh, good comments. I'm getting people saying yay. I also have the trolls and, and the minions who are trying to discredit me and take me down. But you know, I am not going to be deterred by this because I know I'm on the right side on this. People want their freedom. They want their independence to make their own decisions. And we can do that in Oregon. We are responsible people who can set our own destiny. And our exactly. governor needs to allow us to do that. Exactly. When they try and say you can't be with your family on Thanksgiving, you know that that's that's a line we can't let them cross. Judy, great, great. Well, to and hear that's from you really true, um, Tucker. The isolation is killing us. She's not addressing the the isolation and the fallout, for instance, from mental health that comes in the form of child abuse, suicide rate is increasing, and domestic violence. Okay. And that really needs to be addressed. She has no solutions to that. Her main edict is to shut down and keep people separate. We, as human beings, have that right to be together. Exactly. And look around. How many people do you know who are fragile and neurotic and unhappy and unwell, really, psychologically, and it's a result of this nonsense? Thank you for fighting back. Great to see you. Thank you. <clears throat> I had no idea that my little innocent post would do that. I was just merely expressing my feelings, and it was feelings about the governor's executive order saying you can only have six people for dinner. If you didn't, she would send the police, find you, and arrest you in your homes. What this Facebook was really about was a challenge to a governor who violated our Constitution. But you have never heard me mention the word constitution. Why? Because most people don't care about it. Am I right? What they do care about is being able to have the freedom to engage in honest activities they wish the government would just leave them alone, and the governor quit telling them what to do, and isn't that just one and the same? Never in a million years, honestly, and I've had great Facebook and social media success, never in a million years would I guess that this would gain so much attention. I answered 13 media interviews just like this all over America in six days. I was across America, Canada, and in the United Kingdom. And after nine long months of lockdowns with no end in sight, I too was so frustrated that I vented on social media. And honestly, I don't recommend it. Most people don't care which law is violated. They just knew her edict was wrong. It's a violation of most of our constitutional rights all rolled up into executive orders by those who have more power than you or I. If you want to win and take back all the rights that have been lost just in the last year since the COVID declaration, start playing smarter. I don't believe the government has the right to interfere with our family lives. Some of us may never see another holiday dinner, graduation, or wedding with our loved ones. Good government, at the local level anyway, where I represent Clackamas County, is just one step away from someone's life, health, or safety. And don't mandate who can come into your home. That's a lot of responsibility. And it's time our, um, our own government understand their roles and implications in citizens' lives. How do we do this? How do we take our power back? Use your voice, speak your truth from your heart. Be fearless at a time 
where fear abounds. When I decided to run for chair of Oregon's third largest county, by population, but we have over a million acres, and 16 cities, and, and 70 boards and commissions, of which I get to be chair along with 2,500 employees who are equally fearful and don't know what to do. Only about five people thought I could win because I was challenging a 12-year liberal incumbent. I knew I could win because I came from the place where I was born and where I live, and I could see people around me being unhappy. And I put together a political plan. Can I see a show of hands of people in this room who have a personal political plan? A personal political plan. That's the buzzword that you're going to go home with today, a personal political plan. It's a silly question, not really. You make financial plans, right? You make, you make vacation plans, you make dinner plans, and you even made a plan to come here today. I submit that this in this day and age where our rights are not only challenged, but they're taken away daily, that each person in this room needs to have in your being and in yourself your own personal political plan. And I did. That sounds scary to you, really? Mm, not. How many times have you talked to your family and friends about politics? Politics happens to be the hot topic, if you haven't noticed. I bet you said something like, well, government should do this and they shouldn't do that, right? And we're really good about complaining to each other. But have you ever thought about how to change the behavior of a government whom you disagree with? Become an activist, and you've heard about that all day today. Yeah, you can run for office, but there are so many other areas to influence governor, government for change. You don't have to run for office because, hey, not everybody wants to do that. But some people are really good at number details, and some people are really good at engineering details. And the best way is to start at the local level, and can we set aside national politics for a while? I'm serious, because it's splitting us apart. I mean, when was the last time a president of the United States ever visited Oregon? They're not paying attention, they don't care. And what votes we do send to Washington, D.C., they take for granted. Okay, as I mentioned before, in Clackamas County, we have 70 boards and commissions where volunteers are appointed by WA and my fellow commissioners. And in those positions, you don't have to run for office. You go online, you submit your application, and you fill out the paperwork, and you send it in. And those positions influence policy because these groups make recommendations to my board and me for consideration. Do you know how powerful that is? We had a torrid situation last week where our budget committee, making up of uh, four or five volunteers, tried to, in my opinion, uh, assault the sovereignty of Clackamas County leadership by trying to make a motion and do something that was not in the bylaws to do because they disagreed with one of our commissioner's public opinions he made. And they wanted to take away his salary. The problem is we are considering salaries of every elected official in Clackamas County. Had I allowed that vote to continue, and I did not, as chair, I wheeled my gavel 16 times. What would have those people have done? They would have, let's say, they disagreed with what our sheriff did. The sheriffs are always in the news because somebody's getting shot or somebody runs over a dog. Or what if they disagreed with our county treasurer because they didn't make the right investments? Or what if they disagreed with our tax assessor because they're collecting taxes that are allowed by law? That was a very, very dangerous precedent. But it goes to show 
We need right people in these positions that will uphold the Constitution of not only the United States, but Oregon as well. And if you don't want to do that, and it takes a minimal amount of time, make it a habit of emailing or calling elected officials, and I know you have done that. But don't be threatening. Be respectful when you disagree. Sometimes the elected official has no idea the impact that their policy is affecting you. Don't assume that that elected knows everything because we are inundated with thousands and thousands of requests. And I have a perfect example of that that happened to me this week in Clackamas County. Has anyone ever heard of the Red Fox Motel? Nope, because I didn't either. Until the staff members from our Health, Housing, and Human Services Department brought us a proposal to buy the facility in Estacado with free state money, and this really was free state money, that would soon expire if we didn't jump on it. The allocation of money was for displaced uh, people from wildfires, but somehow we're doing it now. However, what became it was a temporary place for the homeless. So they switched it. They wanted to make a temporary place for the homeless. And then later on, at some point, I don't know when, we could use it for low-income housing. And this was a program that I inherited from the previous board, and we needed to act immediately before the money expired. It was $3 million. And for a county, that's a big deal. And it's a big deal for our housing situation, right? Well, mm, what I didn't realize is our county people did not bother to ask the estacated city government or the citizens what they thought of their ideas. So I go in 6.30 one morning in my office and I get this call from the citizen. I think, well, you know, it's kind of early, so I called her back. And she gave me about a dozen reasons why this did not make sense. And we talked for 20 to 30 minutes with her, and she was so right. And she convinced me at that moment that this is not a good idea. And you know what else she said? She says, out here in Estacada, we have this huge group of grassroots activists left over from the wildfires. And if you don't watch it, we're going to have them all email you. <laughs> and I said, this is the email address, and this is the phone number. You better get on it, because it's coming up for a vote in two days. We were inundated with, inundated with emails and phone calls, and it was really a lot of fun. And at this week's business meeting, just Thursday, two weeks ago, the policy was voted on. Many of our residents, many of the residents from Estacada showed up in person to testify against it, and our, my staff told me they hadn't seen that in a year. People coming back to our business meetings, and by the way, that was one of the first edicts that I said that commissioners will be in person, sitting at the dais, doing business. <laughs> Now, as chair, I made the motion to kill the, per the, to kill the purpose, uh, excuse me, the purchase of the uh, Red Fox Motel. And there was a lot of discussion and argument. Well, the motion passed 3-2-1. And the point is, if that lady had not called and explained to me in detail without yelling and screaming and threatening, I, you know, if she did, I probably would have hung up because I've had so much of that lately but it was so nice to hear a reasonable voice why not to do this. And my point is, do you have a Red Fox motel in your neighborhood? But it may not be a hotel. It may be some other issue. I would say that these people quickly develop their own personal political plan bred out of passion. You can also volunteer at your community center, deliver Meals on Wheels to senior residents. There's water boards, fire boards, school boards, and you probably heard of those today. In fact, there's a ton of school opportunities, especially now that parents need help with educating their kids. And why did I run? Because it was very personal to me. 
This is where I was born and raised. And the government policies became personal to me and intrusive. I dedicated my time to saying my truth. For 16 months, I posted every single day on Facebook. And I was not paid to do it. I picked the topics. And my passion was increased taxes. Because I decided money is personal to people and money is emotional. And taxes are money. And the legislature just happened to fall on my lap because they wanted to raise 241 different taxes in the 2019 legislative session. And the only thing I had to do was explain the bill. I didn't even have to give my opinion about it. And my social media took off. Then I got smart about it. I said, man, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I hired Greg. Yes. And I happened to build a huge following. And you know, the only thing you have to do is pick one or two topics. And you can't be an expert on everything, and Lord knows I'm not. Pick your passion and be consistent on it every day. And after a while, you'll get noticed like I did. It takes some time to get out of this situation that we feel that is not right. But I will say this, we did not get into this situation overnight. And we're not going to get out of it overnight with a couple recalls on the governor. It's going to start at the local grassroots level, and we must build it up from there. Never give up. And it's going to be harder for our side. We have to work 10 times harder and be smarter, but you know what? You can do it. If I did it, you can do it. And, and the nice thing about this is they're kind of arrogant. They think they own everything. And we can catch them off guard through tenacity, hard work, and the most important ingredient that we all have is the love right here in our hearts. So what's your political plan? What can you do to help your community? It doesn't have to be a grandiose gesture at all. It can be as simple as sharing your voice and sending productive emails and talking points, like the folks did to me at the Red Fox Motel. So why are we here today? What is the purpose of living our lives? Could it be just service? Develop your personal political plan, and it will echo out into the greater good. Thank you. I think we have some time left. Okay, this is one of my Facebook posts. I had a friend go snowshoeing with me on Mount Hood. We were up at government camp, and it was packed two weeks ago. And in the village, people were wearing masks. We go out into the trail, and my post was, gee, a lot of people are wearing masks, but I took mine off for this photo op thinking that I couldn't get COVID from a snowman. And it was one of these plants. It kind of says about my little quirky, sassy personality. But I wanted to wait to see what the trolls did. <laughs> sure enough, they got so mad that I didn't have a mask on with a troll. Oh, Tootie, you are terrible. You're infecting, you're infecting, you're infecting. And it, it, was, it had pretty good success. Are there any questions? Any questions are, are there any questions for Commissioner Smith? Come on. I don't want to stand here by myself. There's a lady over there. Yeah, I see her. I see her. That's, that's, she's great. Okay, Lily. Am I disappointed? I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for serving and standing up. Oh, you're welcome very much. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for standing up to Governor Brown. That was a fantastic video. You know, a lot of people don't know this. Well, maybe they do, but uh, she also did an interview with Stuart Varney on Fox Business, and that was a good one, too. So she, I think she I went around. through the Fox lineup, and then I also went through the Portland lineup. Oh, very good. Excellent. By Excellent. the way, the governor called me two nights ago. Uh-oh. Tell us, tell us. <laughs> what, what did she call you? 
Well, Commissioner Smith, how are you doing? You are sure taking over in troubled times, aren't you? Was the first line out of her mouth. Well, yes, I am. And Governor, in case you haven't noticed, Clackamas County Commission has been in the news lately. Maybe you folks have seen that, and that's never a good thing. We kind of laughed about that. You have to remember, Kate Brown and I served in the legislature 2001 through 2005. Yes, yes. And I have stories, but I'm not going to tell them today. But what she wanted to know is she's calling the chairs of the Tri County, uh, uh, the Tri Counties. So Oregon is the third largest county by population, but we have like 10 times more acres. So the chair of Multnomah County is Deb Kafori, and then the chair of Washington County is Catherine Harrington. And every week we have a conference call with a governor's staff member to talk about COVID and the vaccination. So she called me with an update letting me know about the vaccination. I have a lot of people in my county who want to have the vaccination, okay. but I remain oh, true to you. one at maxim, and that is it should be your choice whether you have the vaccination or not. And I talked to her about the distribution channel. I told her Clackamas County would be available to help her work on the distribution, that we had really good staff people to do that. She informed me we were getting about 30,000 vaccinations a week, but next week she is hoping to get an additional uh, amount of 50,000 vaccinations a week. And we talked for a while and she ended the conversation. She says, Tootie, if there's anything you ever need or want, just call me, just ask. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, there is. Right? I said, I have a plan. And my plan as county commissioner is, we know that more viruses are coming. And we've been in a lockdown for 10 months now, or almost a year now, wearing masks and social distancing. And let's face it, Governor, our cases are still increasing. Let's look at the problem differently. Let's try to put a plan together that actually stops known and unknown viruses for the future. And I have three areas to do that. And by the way, the paper, my white paper, is on my website, tootiesmith.oregon. I published it in May, and it's there. And it's tried and true scientific research. So I laid out one, two, and three. And she said, uh-huh, uh-huh. And by the way, I think that you could convene a task force, and I would chair it for you. I would chair it for you. I would participate. You bring your staff. We bring all the known data in here. And let's start looking at this differently because we cannot afford to be in a lockdown month after month, year after year, thinking the bug is going to go away. We need to be proactive, right? Well, she says, those are good ideas. Those are good ideas. Hmm, hmm, hmm. We'll see what happens. Let's see if she goes go ahead and starts the tax force with my three ideas without me. That, that might that might happen. Michael Strickland has a question. Then this lovely lady does. Yeah, on uh, Zoom here, uh, Dmitri Shashenko. You're gonna love this question. Hi, Dmitri. <laughs> uh, ask her what we can do as constituents to help Commissioner Mark Scholl, or is he gonna be recalled? And maybe ask her take on this matter. Ask my take on the recall. On the, I guess, the Mark Scholl matter in general. Well, that was a do hard, probably the hardest decision I've ever made in my adult life. And I've had to make some hard ones. Um, for the first time in many years, the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners has a fiscal conservative majority. Uh, evidently, Mark and Greg alluded to it, but he didn't mention his name. They had discovered some um, comments that he made regarding the Muslim community um, certain groups here and certain groups here, and it blew up in our face. I had no idea that those were made. And calls for his resignation came instantly in from some groups, came in so fast, I wondered how they knew about that. Right? And so it just, it just threw the staff upside down, and honestly, it has thwarted my agenda going forward for about a month. So I made a statement denouncing and, con and condemning his remarks because I don't agree, agree with him. I'm not a homophobe. I'm not a racist. I'm not all these things. 
and I had to put it at bed. I went to Mark, unlike everybody else who called for his resignation, I went to Mark and I says, in his office, he says, Mark, I'm gonna give you 24 hours to do some soul searching. And you need to decide what you do. At the end of 24 hours, I'll be back with your decision. 24 hours went, he says, Tootie, I'm staying, I'm not gonna resign. I said, fine, I'm going to issue a statement. On Wednesday, and the statement said this, and by the way, I had staff, I had one particular staff person pushing me to say certain words in my statement that I refused to do because I was not going to repeat what everybody else had been saying attributed to him. And my statement was this, and it was very simple and eloquent, and it said, in considering the greater good of Clackamas County citizens, I ask, not demanded, I ask Mark Schul to step down immediately. And that was all it was. Well, I used to be in journalism, and so the 24-hour news cycle was, in considering the greatest good of Clackamas County citizens, that was the headline. Get it? And that was a big, that's a big media lesson. So that was still out there. And then I moved, I, call, I told my county council to, um, to draw up some censor documents we were going to censor them. I didn't know if we were or not. I didn't know if my board would go for it. I just said, we'll present it at our business meeting. So we censored him. And what does that mean? It says, uh, you did wrong, you did wrong, you did wrong. But he remains. Because no person in Oregon, and I made a speech on this, I think on January 1st with Blexit, no person in the state, including me, or Governor Brown can compel another elected official to do anything, and that includes resigning. So I had a question, I, I gave three speeches, it was a, two days ago I gave three speeches, and one, this question came up, well, what are you gonna do? Well, I says, this is a process. Mark has decided not to resign, and recall can't happen on a new uh, elected until six months. So we go to June 3rd. And then in Clackamas County, it takes 90 days to gather 30,300 30, signatures, so that takes us to September 4th. If they get enough signatures, and I don't know if they will, the recall would be a month later. So I'm gonna work with him for another 10 months, and everybody else should too. Um, how can you help him? Uh, be his friend. He has apologized, he's reached out to the Muslim community and others. They are working together to the credit of the Iman in Portland and a whole bunch of other uh, spiritual leaders, which I'm thankful of. Um, does a person deserve to be recalled because they said something that they regretted? Gee, how many of us have said something that we regretted? But you know, that's the day, that's what we're living in, so you all be very careful. I don't know how we're going to come out, but what we're gonna do is we're going to continue with our agenda and do what's right for our citizens, and that's all I can tell you. Yes. Uh, Tootie Smith, thank you so much for being here. And my question uh, would be about similar posts to something like this where you then have trolls that are commenting all these terrible and horrible things. And I'm not quite sure if this is a question that you can answer, maybe Greg. How, how would you then respond in, to their comment or if you would respond at all? Thank you. Well, you know, I'm really, really fortunate about responding. I don't have to. Because there's one comment and 20 of my people will dogpile on them. So I'm free. I don't have to comment anymore because I've been doing this so long and my following is so huge. I've got, I don't even know how many. One of my Facebook posts honestly had 425,000 likes. Yeah, it was very shocking. And so I don't think it would ever get that way anymore because Facebook is censoring people. They're, you know, they're taking them down. Taking, so we're talking tens of thousands. I don't know. So that's how I respond. I let somebody else talk for me and I keep it up and I don't take it down because there's nothing wrong with this. We have uh, another question here. Hi, Judy, Brenda Clark here. Hi. Understanding the issue with vaccines and mandatory vaccines, any um, opportunity that we can have in Oregon to uh, pursue therapeutics, like for instance, the hydroxychloroquine in this state, getting it approved, 
there's been doctors censored and blocked all over the country that have had very positive results all over the world with therapeutics. And yet we have people with allergies and comorbidity and having horrible side effects from the side effects of uh, the vaccines. Not alone, they don't understand a lot of nanotechnology and things that are in the vaccine, um, which we don't really know at this yeah. point long-term consequences. So it seems with the therapeutics that we have today, can't that something that be pursued in this state? That was my number three proposal I presented to the governor. Yeah, it was. You know, it's, it's self-care. Don't wait until you get till you get sick before you do something with your body. I happen to be a practitioner of naturopathic medicine. And I go in every month. I have blood tests three, done three times a year. You know, I, I take my, this sounds so trite, but it's really true. I keep my immunity levels up so I don't get sick. And, it, and how I presented it to the governor is every person needs to take a personal responsibility for their own health. Well, don't applaud too loud because you shouldn't be eating the pizza that was served here today. You shouldn't become a diabetic. You keep your weight down and you exercise and you keep your mind right and you engage in spiritual activities that, that permits love to go out into your heart and not hate. And there's a whole list of things and I presented those to the governor. And she says, well, you know, there's some poor communities who won't be able to afford that. It's an issue. What's her excuse? And I says, you know, we don't have to do that for every single person. We can do it for enough of the population so it doesn't spread, and we always have to work on the other population for everything. So, and you're exactly right. It's called nar uh, targeted nutrient therapies. And, you know, I, there's a whole checklist of what I do twice a day. Very. Yeah, uh, somebody said that they were bringing back hydroxychloroquine. Now that Biden's president, I think we're going to see. Who? Yes, right. I've heard that. I've heard that. Thank you for the question. Yeah, she can get. She can tell you that later if you can't hear it. You have another question. I do. So um, you weren't here earlier, and so I'll repeat again. I'm running for school board, uh, the Beaverton School and Board. And what's your name? Jeanette Shada. Jeanette. Yes. C congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I just decided on, well, I'll, I won't get into that. But um, anyway, um, what is your one piece advice for me to, because I know they're going to come after me. Um, oh, so what? I have some very, very prominent opinions <laughs> that are out there. Look, people, quit being a bunch of buttercups. No, no, no. No, I have... I have a spine, You're not going to get your rights back if the first thing out of your mouth is, oh, they're going to come after me. You go after them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, take the offensive is the thing. I think I gave conference. you your, piece of, your first piece of advice. Your second piece of advice is you post daily on your social media and you go and you click on groups in your area, in your zip code, and you just share, you like, you like other people's stuff, and you start develop a following. Yeah, I started doing that this week, so. That's what you need to do. Yeah, I'm only one week in. One week in. I and got you know, Aura Star set up. I got my Anadot set up. I got my bank account set up. I'm ready to push the button probably tomorrow. And you do need two accounts. I think you do need your personal account, and then you need a separate campaign account. And you can share, yeah. and you can share, you know, it's just, it's just a little bit of a formula. Um, and I did it every day for a very long time, and some days I got very discouraged. And some days I took some of the insults personally. But then Greg says, it's not real. They're just trying to take you down. And people will say anything on Facebook in an email when they can't be identified. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so, you know, you just, look, people, you got to get tough enough. You got to make some decisions about taking our state back. And you can't depend on people like me or Senator Kim Thatcher to do your bidding for you because we are only two women. But we're powerful women, but we're only two. Well, and that's, that's why I, I just moved back to Oregon in October 2019. I saw what's going on, and as soon as BLM went into the schools and the uh, material and ODE approved it, I was like, no, I need to do something about this. I uh, thank you. CSE. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, about powerful women, I wouldn't want to cheese either of you <laughs> off, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, we, got, uh, we got another question on Zoom here. Go ahead. Uh, Alice asks, how about 2D running for governor? Oh, thank you. Now remember, Western Liberty Network does not endorse or oppose any candidates. I've had, uh, I've had many requests to do that. Many, uh, yeah, you know, I just took position of chair this month, and I have a lot of work to do in Clackamas County. You know, I work in Oregon City where the place I was born, and it doesn't get much better than that, right? Any more questions? Yeah, one more. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Gregory, and I, I'm curious about your posting habits there. You say every day for a year, um, and one of the problems with the social media is that everything that you do is then an insight as to what you may not intend to be. So, like an example might be if somebody's posting at midnight, they could paint a picture to say, "Look, this person stays up till midnight all the time," and try to use it against you. Do you have some sort of habits that you form of how to release your your uh, your post and then your likes so that the pattern looks uh, less like you're spending 24 hours on your social media and more like oh it's two hours and that's just like after dinner or something. Yes, I do. I post between three and six daily. Three and six. Okay. Because that's what my algorithms indicate to me, and thankfully I have software. I you know I can do it like at, at, at nine in the morning, but I have this software with a timer that does it, and you post a picture, and if you want to know what that is, talk to Greg Burnett. It has saved me so much angst. And I can do it a week ahead of time. If I want to go on vacation, I can, <coughs> thinking that, oh, wow, she's just real, you know. So if you want to go on vacation, it's a good tool to use. But you know what? Like I say, this social media is different even than, you know, I've been on social media since 2009, but. I didn't really get serious about it until about February 2019 is when I started doing all this stuff. And, uh, and then I was at this conference and I was in one of the breakout sessions that Greg was doing and I says, and he said something that, I says, no, wait a minute, now that's not right. And I was kind of, I says, you mean you have to do that? And he says, well, yeah, he says, Tootie, I've seen your Facebook stuff, it's pretty good, don't worry about it, keep doing what you're doing. And then we finally got together and I said, well, I, I want you to teach me everything there is to know about Facebook and social media. And guess what? We haven't even begun to scratch the service because it changes all the time. But Greg and I have such a good working relationship that we're able to do more and more things. And, and, and it's been a lot of fun. It really has been a lot of fun despite some of the bad stuff that comes our way. Are we done, Richard, or we have more time? We're ahead of schedule. Any more quick questions? Oh, we have Lori. The answer, as our Slavic friends would tell you, is da. Yeah. I think that's German. Uh, Chair Smith. When are we going to get untied with Multnomah County on this COVID? I think we just did. You did? Yeah, we did. That's good. Yeah, on the yeah, we're not no longer tied together on that. We are, but we're still working together because because we are. And that I do think it's important to work the two, Oregon's two largest counties. I don't want Clackamas County to be viewed as an outlier. When, by the way. People don't know this about Clackamas County. You think of timber and agriculture. We have the largest medical hubs in the state in Clackamas County. You can't have it yet. Yeah. Yeah, the healthcare medical clusters. Clusters. My concern is there won't be any small business anymore in, in the counties. That's my concern too. Restaurants have now been in the third shutdown. And what? Why would they ever come back? We have begged, meaning the, our three chairs and they are of a, of a different persuasion than I am, but we all agree that our restaurants need to open, our gyms need to open. And I had a question from a Rotary member who has a restaurant, and she says, it doesn't make sense to me that the dress shop and the gift shop next to me can be open, but my restaurant can't. And I said, I agree, restaurants are probably cleaner than the dress shop or the gift shop. It makes no sense, I don't understand it, I don't know when they're coming back, but if I was governor, I'd do it different. Yeah. Just saying. 
One thing about the German, I have German blood in me too. And as I, I often like to joke, I know I have German blood in me because I have an instinctive desire to invade France. <laughs> right. There you go. Yes, we have another question. So, Commissioner Smith, uh, question, when we're looking statewide, Clackamas County, Multnomah County, we look statewide, and we look at what you mentioned to Governor Brown, the devastation that we're facing with loss of jobs, psychological damages, et cetera. Why are the county commissioners going along with the governor and, push, and not pushing back and saying we're opening up our county? We're tired of what you are doing. There's enough Republican counties in this state to say we're pushing back. If, if these business owners felt like they could start opening up their doors, the restaurants, et cetera, so people could get back to work so the state would not be belly aching that they need billions of dollars from the federal government because mm -hmm. they aren't getting the tax revenues. Mm -hmm. it's, it's frustrating. So and since you're here and my commissioner isn't, I'm asking you. Thank you. Well, you know, that's a very fair question. So would you like me wrap up? No, no, I mean after this question, oh. please. Yeah. Sorry, so I didn't would mean you to, like didn't mean to me push to force a business into an activity that they don't want to do by opening? No. We have restaurants in Clackamas County that are opening up, defying the governor's order already. I don't have to tell them to do it. I don't have the authority, seriously. We, I researched how to override the governor's orders. And I feel that I do more good in my current position and fight, and see, I pick my battles. We all are, I mean, if you didn't think that me being on 13 social media platforms in one week wasn't standing up for every Oregonian, rethink your question. I had, you know, the same lady who said that about the dress shop and the gift shop being open, she says, I think you should punish them just like you're punishing me. And I said, no, I am not punitive. I'm not going to act like the other side. Thank you for your question. And the man in the gray had a, yeah. Okay, this will have to be the last question. Okay, thanks, yeah, you bet. Richard. Yeah, the guy in the suit with the mic. <laughs> um, I, I had a, a, a good question to where, uh, being that you're the county commissioner of such a large county, do you have any real strong concerns? What, what's your biggest gut worry? What, what's your biggest gut worry? What are you worried about? And, and I'm not, it's, it's, it's not a rhetorical question. It, I'm just saying that what concerns you the most? What, you know? The, what keeps me up at night Exactly. is the safety and welfare and lives of my citizens. Seriously, we, my, and I'm going to have success in this. And we're going to fully fund our sheriff's department for patrol, investigation, and uh, the jail services. We're also going to build a new courthouse because I will protect Clackamas County boundaries from the city of Portland coming in and trying to devastate us. And we are next door. <laughs> and that is a promise. Thank you very much. You are a great crowd. Tootie, you are fantastic. And she ran a dynamite race, got herself elected Clackamas County Chair. You know, if uh, we had equivalent people doing it in Washington County, boy, that would change things too. But again, it's about building from the bottom up. It's not, you know, running for governor first and then running for school board second, it's the other way around. That's how you get elected, that's how you win, that's how you do things. And Tootie's gonna to accomplish a lot uh, during her tenure, I'm sure, in uh, support of limited government goals. Um, so how is everybody doing today, okay? It's been a long day, a lot of information. Uh, Steve Moore is ready, and so uh, 
we're going to have Mike redo the wiring here, and it'll take about a minute, maybe two. But then Steve Moore will, uh, will. Oh, we're done. We're done. Oh, there he is. Hi, Steve. There he is. Can you hear us? I don't think we can hear you yet. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank so you very I much. To, uh, I need to uh, put some of these slides on the screen. Um, okay. Well, do you, you know how to share a screen, right? It says share screen, but it's. It's uh, uh, the host disabled, so I think somebody has to. Yeah, Mike, our, our Zoom cast allow guy me is to hand I'll, uh, host functions uh, over I'll, I'll set you yeah. to be host. Give me just a second here. I think we're okay. Steve, um, Natasha okay. and I have come to know Steve over the years. Um, he's a great guy, but he's a genius. He's an economic genius, former senior economic advisor to the Trump administration. Uh, prominent in his own right well before that and uh, he has spoken before Western Liberty Network before how many were here three years ago when he spoke at our annual conference yep a few people out here and he had a great slideshow uh, that talked about uh, Trumponomics or something like that and uh, it was fantastic and it looks like he's going to regale us with another wonderful slideshow today and and talk about how uh, activists are going to be able to be effective uh, under the new uh, regime. So anyhow, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to an awesome guy, Steve Moore. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much. By the way, can you um, see these slides? Affirmative. Yes, sir. We can see them. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> first of all, this is a great time to be having this conference. And I, I love Western Liberty Network. You do guys do an amazing job, Richard. So I just want to tip my hat to you. I love doing the, uh, this conference and talking to activists and people who are on the front line of these battles. And look, folks, we are, we're not, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We are up against the left-wing juggernaut in Washington right now and in many state capitals throughout the country, including yours there in Oregon. And so we have to fight back. Uh, I, I really feel like it's so important that we not roll over. I was listening a little bit to your previous discussion, and I agree entirely. Now is the time to not retreat, but to uh, throw our bodies in front of this train because the left is trying to fundamentally transform America in a way that will be destructive to our economy, but much more so than destructive to our economy. You know, our whole, um, our whole history is being erased right now. I don't know if you all saw what happened in California, uh, in San Francisco this past week, where uh, the school board wants to rename uh, something like 12 schools that are named after Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Paul Revere. I mean, there's something demented <laughs> about people who want to uh, say that our great founding fathers are villains and demons. These are people who are truly trying to erase the history of this great country. I've made the case, by the way, that there is no uh, there is no group of people in the history of the human race. So you know, never before have as many incredible intellects and freedom lovers assembled at one place as assembled in Philadelphia in 1776 to cre create the greatest nation on earth and the and and the birthplace of real modern freedom. And for the left to say somehow these people are villains is is vile. And it is a you know, one of the things we all know, nobody is perfect in history. Uh, no, no one is without sin except maybe Jesus Christ. And so this idea that somehow we're going to say, oh, well, this person had this flaw and that person had that flaw, but we're not going to celebrate their contributions is just outrageous. And so we are um, up. I'm shocked at what Joe Biden has done in his first 10 days in office. It's been about 10 days. It feels like it's been about 10 months, not 10 days. Um, these people are. Uh, they have a mission and they are going to steamroller over us if they have the possibility. I think, you know, the biggest joke in Washington is when Joe Biden said that he is going to try to unite the country. Uh, you know, the left has zero interest in uniting the country. What the left wants to do is, is transform America in a way that would be highly negative for the economy. But not, again, not just for economy, our, our First Amendment rights are uh, under assault, you're seeing what's happening with uh, with people's rights to speak out and 
agitate against the government, which is a fundamental First Amendment right, are being taken away. So I'm, I'm frightened right now, frankly. Uh, these people are, uh, are not going to be slowed down unless it's us. Every one of us has to take actions. We have to do what our, what our founding fathers did, which is put at risk our, uh, our fortunes, our lives, and our, our um, you know, honor to, to protect this country from what the, what the left wants to do to, to us. Incidentally, um, I've been in this game a long time, folks. I've been involved in the liberty, freedom movement for, you know, I'd say I, I moved to Washington in 2000, I'm sorry, 1984. So that's what, 36 years. And I've seen patterns, you know, history does have a way of repeating itself. That's the reason it's so important. We all know history and study history. And it would, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if, if, our, if our kids were learning history, they are not. But one of the lessons of, of modern history, it, think about this, when Bill Clinton took office uh, in 1993, and then when uh, Obama took office in 2009, and now we're seeing it again with Biden taking office in 2017, in each of those instances, what happened? The left believed that America was a liberal country that wanted socialism and massive government. And the fact is, that's not what the American people want. In fact, if you look at what happened in this year's election, by the way, at the state level, I can't speak for Oregon, but in most states in the country, it was a red wave. It was not a blue wave. Uh, you know, people, the, Trump lost the election, if he did, because of his personality, not because of his policies. Uh, but Americans, we still do believe in limited government. We still do believe in self-reliance, and we still believe in you know fundamental First Amendment freedoms that are at risk right now. So my point is that both in all in the first two instances, when Clinton took office, and then when Obama took office, within two years we had the biggest revolt against liberalism in the history of this country. And I was there uh, working with Newt Gingrich in 1994 when we took back Congress. So that was called the Republican Revolution. Uh, by the way, I know that this is a nonpartisan group. So I, I'm not a rah-rah Republican by any means. There are some good Democrats and there are some really bad Republicans. But uh, you know, right now, the, the, unfortunately, the Democratic Party has really been taken over by the radical left. And anyway, we, you know, we saw the massive uh, rebellion of American families and American voters against the left-wing uh, direction that Bill Clinton took the country in. And by the way, after those first, after Republicans took over Congress, I have to give Clinton credit, he did move to the middle and we had some very productive years in the, uh, you know, I'm kind of a fan of Bill Clinton once he became a, mo a true new Democrat. I don't think, by the way, Bill Clinton could ever run as a Democrat in today's Democratic Party. By the way, John F. Kennedy would be laughed out of the party with his positions. John F. Kennedy was pro-tax cut, he was pro-life, he was pro-trade. Uh, he was. Uh, he was. Um, he took on the militant unions. Uh, that none of those positions are things that the um, Democrats believe in today. And then, of course, in 2009, you all, part most of you, participated in the the revolt that happened. Some people call it the Tea Party revolt when we saw massive uh, losses by Democrats in 2010. Uh, because Americans were fed up by the left-wing direction that Obama tried to take the country with respect to tax increases, uh, massive increases in regulations, Obamacare, and so on. And I think we're at the same uh, point right now where I even talked to Demo some of my Democratic friends are completely shocked by what Joe Biden is doing. I mean, he's only been in office 10 days. He has 40 executive orders. By the way, whatever happened to Congress, I thought we had a Congress that made laws, but under Biden, it's going to be the executive branch that makes laws. That's a that's a uh, unconstitutional um, uh, use of power, in my opinion. But in any case, I mean, think of the things. I don't have to go over them all, but just in the last five or six days, do you know the Keystone XL pipeline, 10,000 jobs down the drain. He wants to put America back in the Paris Climate Accord, the worst treaty in American history. Uh, he just um, signed an executive order saying, <coughs> Excuse me. He's saying no, uh, no drilling on federal uh, lands, which you know we we are, are energy independent now, and that's going to go away under Biden. He passed an executive. Do you all remember uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, executive order where he said for every new regulation we would have two uh, regulations repeal? I think you all probably remember that. Well, um, you know, not only did Donald Trump um, honor that uh, commitment. 
but it turned out for every new regulation, we had about five or six regulations repealed. Um, I don't know, this didn't get much, much attention, but one of Obama, I mean, uh, Biden's first um, executive orders was to repeal that because Biden said, I don't wanna frustrate our regulators. Frustrate our regulators, the regulators are fr frustrating our businesses. So he has it completely upside down. I mean, I could go on and on. We, you know about the $1.9 trillion spending bill that Biden wants. It has nothing to do with COVID, folks. Nothing to do with COVID. It is a, it is a liberal wish list of Bernie Sanders left-wing programs that would bankrupt this country, that would massively increase the welfare state, massively increase the government health and uh, the federal government's involvement in healthcare and education, which would be a catastrophe. It's a, it's a, uh, I know you're a blue state there in Oregon, but this, this bill would give uh, $400 billion, not a million, $400 billion to blue states to balance their budgets. That's not fair to the red states that have already done it. So my point is we, we are up against some pretty awful people. Uh, I don't think they, um, they realize the kind of damage this agenda will do. So we have to fight, 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 fight. That's why I'm spending this Saturday night. You know, it's, it's 7.30 PM on a Saturday night here, uh, but I wanted to speak to you. So uh, my wife went off to a party. I'm gonna be joining her a little later, but I feel so passionately about this. And, and I really wanna applaud everybody here in, in this room uh, that I see. I see a nice audience. I know there's a lot of people on Zoom watching it as well. Thank you. I mean, you've got a lot of other things you could be doing on a Saturday than helping save our country, but you are saving our country. And, and we need to have, you know, for every one of you, we need to get a thousand others to, uh, to join this crusade to stop the transformation of America. Now, with that said, I wanted to show you some charts because I, I think it's kind of fun. Uh, Mr. Moore? This uh, chart now on the screen, growth in manufacturing, mining, construction. Can you see hey, that? Mr. Moore? Uh, yeah. This is the live stream guy here. Uh, we're uh, asking people if you could uh, set your slideshow to be full screen so we full can screen. see it better right. here now in the room. See. How do I do that? It might be under the slideshow tab at the top. It might Hold be on. in presentation mode, it might be called. Uh, da, 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 Just a, along the, I'm along kind the of top there, slideshow. I'm challenged here, so. It says slideshow. Yeah, just to the right, yeah. Let's see if that uh, goes to presentation. From, from, you may hit from current slide there on the left. It says from beginning. Then yeah, try the from current slide. The yep. next one over, yeah. Oh. There we go. Thank you. I can see it. Okay. So I just wanted to run through these because it's important to understand that what, you know, under Donald Trump, and I was very uh, honored to have worked for Donald Trump as a senior advisor on the economy. By the way, I do not, uh, I, do, I do not defend Donald Trump's actions after the election. I, I, I think they are in, in, in many ways indefensible, but we cannot allow the left, which is, you know, denigrating Trump, uh, you know, to be, look, his policies worked, his policies worked. It doesn't matter what you think of Donald Trump's personality or his behavior, his policies work. So I wanted to show you some of these because it's amazing because what, what Biden is trying to do right now, and by the way, you know this, Joe Biden is not running the White House. You know that, don't you? Joe Biden is not running this White House. It's being run by Susan Rice and other left-wing, you know, very liberal Democrats. They're basically putting pieces of paper in front of Joe Biden's face and he's signing them. I don't know if you've seen on YouTube, um, this this video of, of Joe Biden signing one of the executive orders, and he's saying, "I don't even know what this is." Joe Biden is not running the White House; it's being run by you know left wing activists, and so they are trying to erase Trump and everything that he did. And the question is, why? These are people who say that they believe in science, and the science shows that what Trump did was effective. So look at this one. This is blue collar jobs. Uh, this is through the end of. 2019 before COVID hit, which obviously was a game changer. By the way, if it had not been for COVID, tr Donald Trump would have won a 40 state re-election landslide. There's no question. The economy was absolutely booming like it's never done in 40 years before. And you can see, you know, this is what liberals do. They kill blue collar jobs. Look what happened under Obama. Look at the decline in blue collar jobs under Obama, especially with mining and manufacturing and construction. And then Trump comes in and it's like a V-shaped curve where it just takes off. And so it's so it's more than just symbolic that the first act by Joe Biden, which was, I thought, outrageous, a guy who said he was going to put the economy first, um, killed uh, the Keystone Pipeline 
uh, which is something like 15,000 highly paid union jobs uh, because they don't care about blue collar workers. They care about other um, issues. So that one's kind of interesting. One of the things we have to point out to people, we as free market conservatives and liberty lovers are being accused of being racist. And obviously Donald Trump is, was called a racist virtually every day he was in office. And if you look at this, I mean, come on. The, the blue line, the blue part of these charts is, is the, were the Obama years, the red uh, charts are uh, what happened under Trump. You know, you could make a case that no president in 50 years has done more for black America and Hispanic America than Donald Trump did. The unemployment rate for blacks and Hispanics went to their lowest levels ever. Whenever you hear um, liberals, you know, whenever they're losing an argument, they call us racists, right? That's their standard thing. They're losing the argument. So they say you're a racist or you're a misogynist or you don't like black people or you don't like this. Or their latest thing is that, you know, they're even calling people, you know, uh, Ku Klux Klan members and so on. It, these policies help minorities. These help, and this is one of the reasons Trump did, you know, relatively well actually for with with black voters and Hispanic voters. The reason Donald Trump lost the election, by the way, was because rich white voters voted for Biden. It's, it wasn't because we lost um, the minority vote. We got a bigger percentage of the minority vote. Um, small business optimism went up under Trump. And by the way, you're seeing small business optimism declining now under under uh, Biden. He's only been in office for, you know, it's only been two months before since the election. But since the election, small business optimism has gone way down. And by the way, this is an important point, folks, because we as free marketeers, we stand with small businesses. We stand with small businesses. The left doesn't care about small businesses. They care about corporate America. It's exactly the opposite of how they're portrayed. Small businesses, I heard your discussion earlier, uh, uh, someone asked a question about why, how it was unfair to small businesses, small restaurants, small stores, small delicatessens, uh, you know, uh, small hardware stores and so on, that they were shut down by Democrats, but the, the uh, big boys like, you know, Walmart and uh, Home Depot and other major companies like uh, Amazon were able to continue to remain open. Uh, I'm not disparaging those companies. They did a great job, but it never made sense. Somebody has to explain to me why Walmart was allowed to stay open, but not Joe's hardware store. So my point is we, our policies benefit small businesses, their policies benefit corporate America. 60% uh, of the jobs are created by the people in this country who start businesses and have less than hundred employees. Well, they are the backbone and spinal cord. By the way, how many of you, I can see you guys in the audience. How many of you are business owners? Raise your hand. I see, I see a few of you. Well, thank you. You guys are the, you guys are the heroes of the economy. Thank you for what you do. Um, I wanted to show this. Can you see this full screen and Trump, the Trump part of this? This is amazing. I and mean, what we did for middle class workers was spectacular. We saw a uh, actually this none these numbers were recently revised. It's not 4100, it's almost $5,000 increase in incomes under Trump. Now this is prior to the you know to uh to the uh COVID, but we've never seen anything like this. The increase in incomes for the middle these are middle class folks. This is this is median family income went up more under Trump than the previous three presidents combined. Think about that. Amazing, amazing performance in terms of making uh, middle-class people better off. Um, Trump cut regulations. Biden is going to increase them. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, we cut tax rates and we actually got more revenues in. You know this. This is a basic law of economics. When you cut tax rates, oftentimes you can get more revenue. And in, in many cases, this is showing that actually the top 1% actually paid more income when tax rates came down. Biden, Biden's tax plan is very frightening. He wants to raise the death tax. He wants to raise the corporate tax. He wants to raise the small business tax. He wants to raise the capital gains tax. He wants to raise the dividend tax. He wants to raise the, raise the payroll tax. It's a killer for the economy if we allow that to happen. Uh, you know, I, I, some of you have seen this before, sorry. Uh, this is a John F. Kennedy quote, <clears throat> and it shows how far the left has moved away from the what used to be well, uh, you know, well understood economics, even by Democrats. And he says a paradoxical truth: the tax rates are too high, and tax revenues are too low. And the soundest way to raise the revenues in the long run is to cut the tax rates now. 
That's John F. Kennedy shortly before he was assassinated. Um, as I said before, if John F. Kennedy were alive today, there is no question John F. Kennedy would be a, a free market Republican. He would have no place in this Democratic Party that has take, been taken over by the left. Um, you can see that we cut the, the business tax rates. That had a, had a big effect. By the way, anybody who wants these charts, uh, just drop me an email. I'm at steve.moore at heritage.org. Uh, and I'm happy to send them to you. They're really um, quite valuable if you're, if you're debating some of your uh, liberal friends. Um, that this is just showing you is that we had the highest business tax rate in the world. Trump came in and he cut that business tax rate. And all of a sudden we had a lot, we sucked in a trillion dollars of capital from the rest of the world. Um, I'm gonna kind of speed up a little bit here. Uh, <coughs> this is really an important one, folks. What has happened in America in the last five or six years has been the massive increase in, in U.S. Um, oil and gas output. It's a spectacular story of success. <coughs> Excuse me, just one sec. So you're seeing with the red line, that's the decline in imports. The blue line has been the massive increase in production. How great is this? I mean, how spectacular is this? We actually had, um, we had a, we, we achieved energy independence for the first time in any of our lives. <laughs> you know, this is something to be celebrated. This is something to be continued. In January of 2021, this month, this month, because we just got the numbers for January, tomorrow is the last day of the month. This was the first month in 60 years that the United States imported zero, zero oil from Saudi Arabia. Think about that. And I know that is an amazing statistic. Zero oil from Saudi Arabia. Now, Biden is trying to destroy our oil and gas industry. And that means these numbers are going to reverse, right? Because we're going to produce less oil and gas. That means as we produce less, we have to import more. And I don't, I, I think I'm probably older than a lot of you. One of the things, I think I see a lot of young people in this audience, which is great. But anybody in this room remember, <clears throat> old enough to remember gas lines in the 1970s when the energy prices went up? I mean, raise your hand. I see a few people. I mean, it was a disaster. We had to, we, we, the, literally the Saudi Arabians and OPEC had a knife right at our neck, right? All they had to do was cut off the glass supply and they could, Remember this, they could just thrust the American economy into a recession. Um, those were the days that we put long behind us. But I guarantee you, if Biden goes forward with his radical energy policy, we are going to see, uh, you know, OPEC and, the, and, and by the way, the Saudis as well. And, and another thing, I mean, this is an amazing story. The, uh, I just looked up these latest numbers. Today in the United States, we get 80%. 80% of our energy comes from oil, gas, and coal. Oh my God, the horrible fossil fuels. 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. You know the reason why? Fossil fuels are a very efficient way to produce energy. That's why, you know, that we have windmills in the, you know, back in the Middle Ages. That's not, that's not a new technology. Technology, what they're trying to do is take us back to the Middle Ages with respect to energy. There is no way you're going to be able to fuel and power a $21 trillion economy that produces steel and food and, you know, uh, cars and factories and, and the, the internet that the cloud system uses massive amounts of energy. You can't power that with windmills and solar power. It's impossible. Right now in America today, people are surprised by these numbers. We get 5%, we only get 5% of our energy from wind and solar power. So even if we were able to quadruple that amount, where are we gonna get the other 80%? This is a very dangerous thing. If you want to destroy an economy, you destroy its energy source and that's what we're facing right now. Um, you know, uh, cheap and uh, cheap, I mean, abundant energy produced in America means lower prices. If we have to make the point folks, this is really important. What Americans care about, they middle-class Americans and low-income Americans care a lot about what the gasoline price is that they pay at the pump. I don't know what you're seeing in Oregon, but in Virginia, where I live, we're seeing the price. Are you guys seeing the price of uh, gasoline go up at your pump? Because we're seeing it. We've seen about a 30-cent increase in the price of uh, gasoline already. 
Uh, and that's just the start of it. Because look, if you reduce the supply of gasoline, what happens to the cost? It goes up and that really hit, hammers you know, middle-class families. Um, we should stop subsidizing. This just shows you the subsidies. You know, the left was, oh, we, we subsidize uh, oil and gas. No, we don't. We don't subsidize oil and gas. What we subsidize is wind and solar power. And look at this, per, you know, per unit of power generated, the, 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 the amount of uh, subsidies are massive for wind and solar. And this is just beginning. They want to quadruple, uh, you know, they want to spend hundreds of billions of dollars with further subsidies for wind and solar. What, what a stupid idea that is. By the way, I'm not against wind and solar power. In some places, it makes a lot of sense but we should not have the government deciding that. That should be decided by the private sector, by the free market system, not by government subsidies. You know, we have the cleanest air in the, in, in the United States, in the world today. And this is just showing you the trends of, you know, Trump was right. Under Donald Trump, we had the cleanest air in 50 years. We had the cleanest water in 50 years. The idea that he was pro-pollution or that he didn't care about the environment was just a, got, a damn lie. You know, I get angry about this stuff because all these, they do is lie. We, keep, we continue to reduce our pollution levels, even as we produce more energy. Um, oh, you know, <laughs> look at this. Now, this is, about, this is um, about two years old, but these numbers haven't changed much. Only out of the 30 major countries that signed the Paris Climate Accord that, that Joe Biden just put us back in, of the 30 of them, only two are meeting the targets. Think about that. So we just rejoined a treaty, by the way, I think one of the best things Donald Trump did as president was get the United States out of this, this outrageous, worst trade, worst uh, treaty ever, the Paris Cli Climate Accord. We re-entered it even though 28 out of the 30 countries are cheating. You know, how stupid is that? I mean, the rest of the world really is laughing behind our back. They love the fact that we're re-entering this because we're going to pay the bills you all know what country is the largest polluter in the world. It's China, and it's by a mile. And China doesn't have to do anything with their energy policy, and they're using all, they're the biggest polluter. They don't have to change their policy for 10 to 15 years. We have to shut down our energy right now. That is not putting America first. That's putting China first. It's outrageous. Um, you know, this is just showing, look, China is by far the biggest polluter in the world. They pull their you know, something like twice as big a polluter as we are, even though we still produce more than they do. And it, if you include, you know, India, you know, you're seeing uh, about a third of all the pollution comes from countries that are going to increase their carbon emissions, not reduce them. Uh, I'm going to make a few more points and then take some questions from you all. I'm just skipping ahead because I know I just wanted to show you that. Um, you know, if this is a, something I say all the time, and if you've heard me before, you know, I, you know, you're probably tired of me saying this, but it's so important. You know, when you look at prices, uh, the, what you're seeing here is the two industries over the last 20 years that have had the largest increase in price, you know, the highest inflation rate are education and healthcare. Education and healthcare. Now, what is that? You know, why is that interesting? Because energy and healthcare are the two industries that are most uh, dominated and regulated and owned by government. Think about that. You know, uh, half of our healthcare industry today is government and about 70% of our education system is now government. And, you know, when I ask my liberal friends, why do we have, those are two of the most important industries, right? Health and education. And we've turned those over to the government and when I ask my liberal friends, why do we do that? They say, oh, we have to have the government run healthcare and education uh, because they, they make it more affordable. Well, folks, look at it. They're not doing a very good job of it, are they? You know, when you have, uh, when you have the government run things, uh, the prices go up. When you have the private sector run things, you see much lower rates of inflation. Or in the case of automobiles, clothing, furniture, computers, prices go down. I submit to you, that the greatest scam in America today is how much our education is costing us. And I would also submit to you that what's happening in our schools right now is, is one of the greatest examples, uh, incidents of national child abuse that I have ever seen. There is no case whatsoever for schools being closed down. They should have never been closed down and they should be opened up 
right now across the country, it is outrageous. We now have a, almost a year of kids going without schooling that is doing severe damage to our nation's children. I've got two teenagers here in my house and they are being very negatively affected. But the online is not working. And especially for young kids, especially people who are, you know, especially for boys who are not very good at sitting in front of a computer screen unless they're playing computer games. So um, that's the education story. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna just stop there and just say one last thing and then, and then let's take some questions. I'm, I'm sorry, I've gone on longer than I should, but I just feel really passionately about all these things. Um, the lockdowns in America have been a catastrophe. I believe locking down our economy, and I know you guys are under pretty strict lockdowns there in the Northwest, especially in Oregon. This has been one of the most outrageous policy failures in the history of our country. The costs to our families, to our businesses, to our freedoms from having the government basically step in and shut down our economy have been multiple times greater than the benefits. It's not even close, folks. We should have never shut down our economy, never. And we can never let that happen again. And by the way, Joe Biden, these people, they want to shut down the economy again. They want to. Uh, and so we cannot allow that to happen. Um, the evidence is crazy. Crystal clear. And if you want that evidence, by the way, I have, I have so many charts I could show you that show conclusively that states that did not lock down their economy have done better job in terms of maintaining good health for their citizens than the states like New York and California and my home state of Illinois and others that had severe lockdowns. It's also true internationally, too. The states that had the countries that had severe lockdowns were not able to stop the spread of this terrible virus. And look, I'm not minimizing this is a health crisis, no question about it. But you don't shut down your economy. What you do is keep your vulnerable populations, which is older people, safe. And and you know, I've got to tell you one last thing. In the last three weeks, I went to California about three weeks ago. Everything was shut down. It was like ghost town in Los Angeles and San Diego and other cities in California. It was spooky. Um, then the next week I go to Florida and everything is opened up. Everything, the restaurants are open, the beaches are open, the stores are open. The only reason you'd even know there's a pandemic is people are social distancing and they're wearing masks. Um, but other than that, you've got a, you know, you've got a great uh, economy going there. In fact, half of the country, by the way, is not in recession. The states that are in recession are the blue states run by militant Democrats who like shutting down businesses, shutting down stores, shutting down restaurants, and shutting down our schools. And we need to educate voters about what, a, what an incredible disaster that has been, an abuse of power. And what worries me, and this is the last thing I'll say and I'll stop, what worries me is if the government can shut down our economy and our stores and our businesses and our schools uh, to fight this COVID, think of what they can do to, to fight what they view as the greatest, you know, catastrophe facing the earth in the history of mankind, which is climate change. They are going to use the most militaristic, Stalinistic kinds of interventions in our economy to deal with climate change when the rate, look, the way to deal with climate change is technological change, economic growth, uh, and, and using uh, innovation from the private sector. That's how climate change will be abated, not by all of these government edicts and these stupid international treaties. I mean, is there anybody on this planet who actually thinks that the United Nations is going to be able to do something to change the temperature of the planet? I mean, come on. So what, what is it that Joe Biden says? Come on. Come on, guys. Uh, so anyway, um, that's my presentation. I applaud you all for um, spending a Saturday and really learning about how you can help change our country. We need your help. We need troops. We need generals. I know a lot of you are incredibly active. I know a lot of you want to run for office. We're going to wipe these people out in 2022. We're going to wipe them out across the country. You're going to see the biggest revolt against this that you've ever seen. And Biden's just getting started. Okay, I'm done. Okay, Stephen, we have some questions here from the audience. Can you hear me fine? What's that? Can you hear me fine? I got some questions out here. This I can. Okay, great. Here's the first one. I got a little carried away there, but we got to fight these people, right? 
We have to fight against these people. They want to, they want to intimidate us. They want us to go hide in, in the in the basement with like this, you know. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to fight them and fight them and fight them because our our country uh, depends on it and our children's future depends on it. Hello there. Uh, it is absolutely such a pleasure to be able to speak to you, Mr. Moore. Um, with uh, my question is is in regards to oil and uh, with the recent executive orders with shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline. Now, essentially, this is uh, President Biden is trying to kneecap the whole uh, oil energy sector, natural yes. gas, everything. Um, <laughs> I happen to believe that the, the, the knee-jerk reaction to the unemployment rate is not in the tens of thousands, but in the hundreds of thousands. Might be. When you look at uh, exploration, drilling, yes. extraction, you're talking hundreds of thousands of jobs that are going to be lost in a very, very short period of time. Now, when do you have any forecasts on when the Bureau of Labor Statistics comes out on February 5th, what our actual unemployment rate is going to look like? Thank you for taking that question. Um, I'm just looking for something as you speak, because it's a great point uh, that you're just making. Um, and I thought I had something here. Well, you know, this is just one chart. It shows how important um, oil and gas is to our economy. So this is just showing what happened from December, uh, from 2008 through around 2014. It doesn't even include the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Trump years where the you know, production, uh, th these are jobs you're looking at, these are jobs. And what happened is that, um, well, the, and this is so amazing. It's an amazing story nobody in the media likes to tell. The, what, what led to the, um, to the, uh, what got us out of the terrible recession we had in 2009, remember when the financial system collapsed, it had nothing to do with Obama's policies. In fact, Obama's policies, the $800 billion spending bill had no impact whatsoever on jobs. What the only reason we had a recovery, and, and this is just luck by, by uh, Obama, is that the industry that the left hates the most, the oil and gas industry, is what bailed his, his butt out of the fire. And so you can see, this is just showing Texas versus the rest of the rest of the economy over the, that period. Look at the mass. That red line is showing the massive job losses in uh, all of the states except Texas. Now, wh why is Texas important? Because Texas is by far the biggest oil-producing state in the United States. Texas actually gained more jobs in this in the first five years that Obama was president than the other 49 states combined. Think about that. Texas gained more jobs than the other 49 states combined, and that's because Texas created millions of jobs in the, in the oil and gas industry and, and related industry. So whoever asked me this question, thank you, because you're right. I was undercounting the jobs. I was just talking about the jobs related to the pipeline itself, but we estimate there are six to eight million Americans that are employed in the oil and gas industry. And by the way, folks, these are not $15 an hour jobs. We're talking about people who work in the oil patch. I've been to North Dakota. I've been to the Permian Basin in Texas. Those people are making 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars an hour. The truckers, the, the unionized pipe fitters, the, um, the construction workers, uh, all of these guys, they're making 80, 90, 100 thousand dollars a year. Blue collar workers, they're great jobs. They're union jobs. Incidentally, just as an aside, do you all know that the pipe fitters union, the pipe fitters union endorsed Joe Biden for president? Is that, is that the most outrageous thing you've ever heard? So Biden gets the endorsement from the union bosses at the pipe fitters uh, union. And what is the first thing Joe Biden does? He destroys 12,000 pipe fitter jobs. I mean, the union, that union the, is, you know, outrageous that they would, Nobody's done more for pipe fitters than Donald Trump has, but the union bosses hate Trump, whereas the union members love Trump. But uh, it's a really good point. We, we have the capacity to be the energy dominant country over the next 25 years, folks. And I'm not talking about with windmills and solar power. 
this is a lie. The way that we become um, energy independent and retain, not just, you know, when I used to talk to Donald Trump about this, and I'd say, Mr. President, you know, if we have pro-energy policies, we can be energy independent. And I'll never forget, he would say, Steve, I don't want the United States to be energy independent. I want the United States of America to be energy dominant, dominant. And we have the capacity to do that. We have more oil, gas, and coal than any other country in the world. Why in the world would we not use it? It just, it makes no sense. The rest of the world's gonna continue to use oil and gas and coal. It's a question of whether they use American oil and gas and coal. And you really got me going here because I wanna mention another thing that people are not aware of. While we're stopping building pipelines here in the United States, China and Russia this summer just agreed um, agree to a, a $12 billion pipeline that's gonna pipeline oil and gas from Siberia and Russia down to China. Now, do you think that China wants that pipeline so they can get off uh, fossil fuels? Of course not. They wanna replace us as an energy dominant country. Uh, and this is putting China first, not the United States first. So it, we really need to strike back on this. The American people want the jobs, they want low price gasoline, and they don't wanna be dependent on China and Russia for our energy. It's a great issue. We have to throw this right back in the face. Okay, next question, Stephen. Here you go. Uh, Mr. Moore, you were there when uh, Newt Gingrich came in and took the speakership. So I'd like to hear from you. What was the correlation between the unemployment rate at that time and the Republican takeover? And do you think that would happen again? Well, I do. And I, I was there. It was one of the most exciting periods of my life, you know, um, I've, I've uh, you know, have, I've had a good life and I've had a lot of fun in doing what I'm doing. I, I, just as another aside, I'm terrified right now, folks. I, I've never been more afraid than I am right now. And, you know, I've never, I just, I think these people are out of their mind. Even the Democratic Party of the 1990s was reasonable. These people are not reasonable. They want to control our lives. They want to control our economy. Uh, and, and it's all about power with the, with the Democrats, at least the vast majority in Washington, D.C. right now. They All they care about is power. They don't care about the middle class. They don't care about jobs. They don't care about my, <clears throat> minorities. They don't care about the poor. They care about political power, and they will use it. And that's why they, the H.R. 1, by the way, under Pelosi, is a bill that would totally transform our election laws. It would basically prevent, it would basically get rid of voter ID. It would basically have massive mail-in balloting. They love mail-in balloting because it's so hard to detect fraud. Uh, all of these things um, are really dangerous. And so when Newt Gingrich came in, it was almost like overnight, the economy, I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. In November of, of, of uh, let's see, that was 1994, in November of 1994, literally the night the Republicans took back Congress, the stock market just took off. Jobs started coming back. Inflation rates and interest rates came down. It was an incredible uh, you know, revolution. And as I said, Bill Clinton then very smartly, he moved to the middle. He moved to the middle and we got some great things done. We had the balanced budget. We cut government spending more under Bill Clinton than any other president in modern times, a Democrat. But Bill Clinton believed in balanced budgets. He believed in welfare reform. And look, I, I'm not defending his behavior in the White House, but you know what happened, that combination of the Republicans taking over Congress and a moderate Democrat in the White House was a great thing. We're so far away from that right now. I do believe that uh, you know, if, if Republicans can take back, by the way, we had a huge market, stock market you know, surge under, under Trump. I mean, and remember, all of the liberals said, if Donald Trump is elected president, we're going to have a, a, a you know second Great Depression. And instead, we have the biggest booming stock market ever and the greatest economy ever. So we have to keep reminding people of that. And by the way, I'm not rooting against the American economy. I'm not rooting against American companies and American workers. I hope I'm wrong. But I think if Biden goes forward with these kind of policies for another six months, we're in for a real tough time. Now, look, the pro the the benefit that Biden has is the economy is going to, if, if Biden just did nothing, if he just did nothing, we're going to have 2021, it's going to be a great year, right? I mean, his timing could not be more perfect. It is suspicious to me, by the way, that the announcement of the vaccine came out one week after the election. 
Did you notice that? One week after the election, they announced this, uh, this, uh, these, these uh, vaccines that are going to save, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives, uh, around, millions around the world and, and, and in the United States. I sincerely believe that if the vaccine announcement had come out before the election, Trump would have won easily. So anyway, my point is that if Biden would do nothing, we'd have a great 2021 as more and more people get vaccinated and the economy opens up. Biden's going to take credit for Operation Warp Speed, which is the stimulus. The stimulus is the vaccine, right? It's not this all the stupid government spending they want to do. $1.9 trillion is just going to put us more into debt. Hey, Stephen, had a quick question here for you from someone that walked up. Um, on the, the Republicans that are, that are leading right now, what is your opinion on their um, apparent uh, attacking of the Trump policies and, uh, and, and, and continuing support of his legacy, uh, apparent op the opposite of from the leadership coming from the Republicans right now? Oh, a couple things about this. Uh, first of all, the never Trumpers have to be um, permanently excluded from the party. Those are reprehensible people. They're selfish. Um, they're, the reason the never Trumpers hate Trump is because Trump um, basically made them irrelevant. They're the old neocons that um, they're, they're hardly, they, they're basically Democrats. I mean, the never Trumpers are Democrats and they're pretending like they're Republicans. So, you know, my view of the never Trumpers is, you know, don't let the door hit your fanny on the way out of the party. We don't need those people. Uh, and they they uh, they pretend like they're Republicans, but they're not. Then they're certainly not conservative free market people. I mean, what Donald Trump did, if you if you're a number Trumper, you're saying, wait a minute, you're against school choice, you're against deregulation, you're against tax cuts, you're against uh, you know all of the amazing things that Trump did in terms of reducing poverty, increasing incomes, reducing unemployment rates, uh, pulling America out of the Paris Climate Accord. You know that I could go on and on and on about the things that Trump did that had such a remarkable impact on our economy. And so um, my view is this, Trump, I, you know, I don't know if Trump can make a comeback. I mean, I think he did some substantial damage to himself and I'm, I'm very upset with him right now because of his behavior in the last couple of months. But we, we have to separate Trump's personality from his performance because it's all about policy. It's all a good about things that make Americans' lives better and expand freedom and liberty. And what Trump did, you know, not all, all his policies, but the vast majority of his policies were unbelievably successful. Don't forget the, the improvement in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the trade deals. He was the first president to get a good trade deal with China. China right now, the, the, you know, <laughs> the people in Beijing are just rolling over laughing right now that we have elected Joe Biden. Joe Biden doesn't even think that China is a threat to the United States. That's like, I mean, in my opinion, China's like Japan circa 1939. These people are dangerous. They, they are involved in predatory economic practices. They are building up their military. They want to take over from us. We need everything we need to do for as a country right now, everything you need to do in Oregon and around the country is put America first. And that's not what Joe Biden is doing. He's putting China first and Russia first and Europe first. Uh, and, and we're going to pay a high price of that. But this is how we take back uh, the political positions. This is how we win every race. I mean, look, for those of you in this audience that are thinking about running for office, whether it's, you know, a county, you know, county job or school board or local, uh, you know, running for uh, state legislature, 2022 is going to be a monster year a monster year for Republicans. We're gonna sweep them out of power from coast to coast, do it in 2022, timing is everything. We're gonna see a repeat of what we saw in 1994 and, 2000, uh, and in 2010. I hope so. Uh, one question here for you, Stephen. Hello, yep. I'm Stacey Ann and I have a, a morning show in Salem on KSLM News. And every morning I talk to the listeners about where are the charts what? that's measuring common sense? And I think I've just found them. <laughs> and, <laughs> First of all, thank you for saying that. I gotta just interrupt you for a second. First of all, I wanna come, can I come on your radio show one of these days? Absolutely, let's get her done. Okay, second of all, um, I I'm glad you mentioned this because I know it's getting late and some people are starting to file out to get back to their families and you know have dinner and so on. Please, please, please. I want every single one of you that is in this audience 
uh, and the people on uh, uh, watching on Zoom and and the folks there in uh, in uh, in uh, in that uh, in that uh, room, uh, send me an email at and here it is Steve dot Moore at Heritage dot org Steve dot Moore at Heritage dot org and I'm going to sign every one of you up for something we we put out every morning that's become incredibly popular. We call it the Prosperity Hotline. It has it's chock full of information every single morning. It's it's usually five or six items you can read it in five minutes. Newt Gingrich called me the other day said, "Steve, this is the best thing to read every morning." And it tells you the it's not the fake news; it's the real news. We take what's going on. Just you know, most of the stories sometimes they're just a headline in a paper or a chart showing you know some of these charts we put in the in the newsletter. But if it, you know, it, we we want everybody in Oregon, every conservative in the country should be getting this. If you have friends, if you have constituents, if you have neighbors who are conservative, get a, You know, all you have to do is sign up for it. You send me the your email, I'll sign you up. Uh, we want to get this all over the country, and it's free. It costs nothing. And so, if you don't like it, by the way, you can just say stop sending it to me. But I think you're going to love it, and it's great, by the way, for talk radio because it's it's a lot of really interesting, you know, information on three things. We cover what's happening with the economy, what's happening in politics, and what's happening with the health crisis and COVID. And uh, we have John Fund. I think a lot of you know John Fund. He and I work together at the Wall Street Journal. He does the politics. We have Bill Kirpin, who's the world's expert on COVID. Uh, almost everything the media tells you about COVID, by the way, is false. They've been lying about this for, for uh, 11 months now. And then uh, in an, I cover the economics. And by the way, a lot of our people around the country send in stuff for us that we didn't see, the local stories. And we put those in the, in the hotline and then it goes national. So please do that. And uh, I want to make sure I get it to uh, everybody who wants it. Okay, Stephen, I have one, one last question. Rich, we have time for one more? Okay, we have one more last question here for you, Stephen. Okay. Yeah, being, being from, I'm Darlene from Springfield. Uh, We've got a lot of liquid sunshine up here in Oregon, and that means we have hydroelectric power, which I haven't really heard people address. Um, our governor does not think that's a renewable resource, from what I understand, and they're even wanting to take out dams. And that out here in, the, in uh, Oregon, that's a big yes. issue, not so much the pipeline right now, but to, as an Oregonian, I'm, cons I'm concerned about them taking out our dams. So it's a great point, ma'am. And uh, I, you know, you're so right. First of all, you're so right. You know, there is one form of, uh, of renewable energy that is a spectacular way to get electricity. It's not wind power. It's not solar power. It's hydropower. It's, you know, uh, we get huge amounts of New York City gets a lot of electricity from Niagara Falls. Uh, so you are exactly right. Hydropower are, is a great way to get electricity and it's cheap and it's clean and yet the left is against it. But think about this, they're against hydropower, they're against natural gas, they're against nuclear power. All three of those are the cleanest forms of energy they are. Somebody explain to me why the left is against hydropower. Oh, well, we don't want dams. What about all the, you know, what about all the damage the windmills do? What about solar power? They want to industrialize the entire, you know, entire uh, wilderness of America with windmills and solar power. You know, you'd have to uh, cover over some, some um, energy experts believe that you'd have to cover over half of the United States land area with windmills and solar power to be able to provide the power that we need to, to you know, have electricity and and, and fuel for our transportation. I mean, how in the world is that green? So I am 100% with you. Hydropower is a great way to get electricity. And we get more renewable energy from hydropower today than we do from uh, wind and solar. It's a great, great point. And we, you know, if you have renewable energy standards there in Oregon, make sure that when they count renewable energy, they're counting hydropower because it's the best form of, of renewable energy. Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. As always, you're brilliant. Well, Richard, you know, I just I thank you for having me. And I just have to say, what you do at um, the Western Liberty Network is fantastic. Uh, you are a hero of mine. And I am a contributor to WLN because I believe in what you do. I believe that it is so important that we continue to have people like those who, you know, spent uh, Saturday 
uh, learning about policy, taking the, what you learned today and taking it you know, to, to uh, educate your neighbors and your friends and people on the school board and everything because we have a real chance. I, I think the, the Democrats are overstepping. They think that we've become a liberal nation. We are not. We are still a, a, a right center nation. Uh, that believes in liberty and freedom and First Amendment rights. And so, Richard, thank you for everything you do. It's always fun to, I'm only bummed out that I can't be there in Oregon. You know, we have a snowstorm coming here tonight in Washington, D.C., so I'd rather be there. Anyway, thanks so much, folks. And if you want to get that newsletter, Steve Dalmore at Heritage, just drop me a line and just say, I want to get the uh, Prosperity Hotline, and we'll start shooting out to you on Monday morning. Well, thank you, Steve. God bless, and have a good time at your party tonight. You better get there before your wife gets mad. Bye. He keeps getting